Episode 3, Presenting Ed Bellamy. Paul Temple, the celebrated novelist and private detective, is visited by Sir Graham Forbes of Scotland Yard and by a Mr Philip Kaufman, who is attached to the special branch. Kaufman tells Paul Temple about a notorious criminal known as Dr Belasco. Temple promises to try and discover the identity of Belasco and during the course of certain investigations makes the acquaintance of David Nelson and Henry Worth. Worth is the proprietor of a small cafe in Soho. Late one afternoon, during a conference at Scotland Yard, Sir Graham receives a letter from a man known as Harry Marks, who promises to reveal the identity of Dr Belasco. Marks is murdered, however, and Temple discovers, on searching the body, that Marks has received an invitation to a cocktail party from a certain Mrs Forrester. The following evening, Temple presents himself at 27A Barclay House Place. This is 27A, Mrs Forrester's? Oh, yes. Yes, indeed, sir. Well, I had an invitation to a cocktail party, oh, a long time ago. As a matter of fact, I think I've got it here The somewhere. party was cancelled, sir. Oh, a long time ago. Mrs Forrester wrote to the guests personally. I'm surprised you didn't receive a letter, sir. Yes, I'm uh, rather surprised myself. Oh, well, if the party's off... By the way, haven't I seen you before somewhere? Not that I'm aware of, sir. I was under the impression that I bumped into you last night at a cafe in Soho. Why, no, sir. You sure? Quite sure, sir. I'm not usually mistaken. What is it, Joseph? I think it's the gentleman you've been expecting, madam. Oh, yes, how stupid of me. How do you do, Mr Temple? I'm Mrs Forrester. Won't you come in? You've been expecting me? But of course. Do come into the lounge, Mr Temple. Joseph, we'd like some cocktails. Yes, madam. I was under the impression that you were having a cocktail party, Mrs Forrester. Yes, I overheard you say so. No, I'm afraid I had to call the party off. It was my original intention to present Martinez, you know, Martinez? The South American pianist. Oh, yes. Poor darling was taken ill on the boat coming over, and, oh, well, what with one thing and another, the whole thing became rather a bore. <laughs> oh, but please, do sit down. <clears throat> Mrs Forrester. Yes? You know, of course, that I never received an invitation to your party. <laughs> yes, of course. And yet, nevertheless, you apparently expected me. Oh, not to the party, Mr Temple. I just expected you. What do you mean? As a matter of curiosity, what did David Nelson tell you about me? He told me that you were a very close friend of his wife's. Is that all he told you? That's all. You know, of course, that Rini, his wife, committed suicide. Yes. She was a very close friend of mine. We were very attached to each other. It was a very great shock to me when I heard what had happened. Yes, I'm sure it must have been. For some peculiar reason, David got it into his head that I was mixed up in the whole business. I don't know quite why he should think that, but he did. You still haven't answered my question, Mrs. Forrester. Why were you expecting me? David employed a private detective, a gal called Mary Hamilton. He instructed Miss Hamilton to, well, pry into my private affairs. Well? Two days ago, Miss Hamilton was murdered. Go on. Shortly after she was murdered, the same night, in fact, Mr. Nelson visited your flat. What are you suggesting? I'm suggesting that David Nelson commissioned you to investigate his wife's suicide. But I stepped into Miss Hamilton's shoes. <laughs> yes. And I knew, of course, that it wouldn't be very long before you took it into your head to visit the wicked Mrs. Forrester. Are you very wicked, Mrs. Forrester? I don't think so. Neither do I. Now, if you'd said stupid... <laughs> what do you mean? I came here this evening because I had an invitation, an invitation to your cocktail party. Here it is. I didn't send you this. No, I know you didn't. Then you would hardly call it an invitation. But it is one of your invitation cards. Yes. <laughs> Where did you get it from? As a matter of fact, I found it. I found it on the dead body of a man called Harry Marks. Harry Marks? Yes. But where did he get it from? Didn't you send it to him, Mrs. Forrester? No, I... <laughs> of course I didn't. I've never heard of anyone called Harry Marks. Have you ever heard of anyone called Dr. Belasco? Yes. What do you know about him? I don't know anything about him. I've... I've just heard of him, that's all. You say that Rini Nelson was a friend of yours? A very close friend. Then have you any idea why she committed suicide? No. 
But surely, if you were really close friends, you would... <laughs> I think you'd better ask Mr. Nelson that question. Meaning, I presume, that Mr. and Mrs. Nelson didn't get along too well together. No, meaning precisely nothing of the sort. So far as I know, they were quite good friends. Are you a friend of Mr. Nelson's? No, we see very little of each other. You don't like him? It isn't a question of not liking him. I find him a bore. I don't care for bores, Mr. Temple. Neither do I, Mrs. Forrester. <laughs> I'm glad to see we have something in common. I've mixed the cocktails, madam. Oh, thank you, Joseph. Just put them down there. Hmm. Is there anything else, madam? No, thank you. Thank you, madam. I hope this is to your liking, Mr. Temple. Thank you. Frankly, I'm not a connoisseur of cocktails myself, but my friends tell me Joseph is quite unique at this sort of thing. Hmm. Mm, how right they are. Delicious. <laughs> I thought you'd like it. Next time you really must invite me to your party. Oh, I'll do more than that, Mr. Temple. I'll make a point of not cancelling it. <laughs> <laughs> well, cheers. Cheers. <laughs> you know, I can't help thinking that you're not exactly a stranger. You see, I've read so many of your books. I hope you like them. Well, frankly, I didn't. You know, for some unaccountable reason, mystery stories always seem to make me laugh. I suppose I must have a perverted sense of humour. Still, I do hope that won't stop us from becoming better acquainted. I hope not, Mrs Forrester. You must meet my wife. Oh, yes. Yes, I must. Come along, Charlie. Come along. Charlie, I've been standing here for hours. Oh. Hello, Mr. Nelson. Ah, it's you. I wasn't sure whether I'd heard the bell or not. What's happened? What are you doing here? Well, uh, as a matter of fact, I was just going to mix your wife a drink. I was trying to find the ice. It's in the kitchen. Surprisingly enough, in the refrigerator. Oh. <laughs> oh. Is that you, darling? Yes. What's going on here, Steve? Well, I'm afraid we had rather a nasty accident this afternoon, Mr. Temple. Your wife's pretty badly shaken. Is she all right? Yes, yes, she's all right, but, well, you know, it's, it's nerves. Hello, Steve. What's the matter? Hello, Paul. Don't get up, darling. Uh, What's happened? I was out shopping and bumped into Mr. Nelson. He said that he wanted to have a chat to you and suggested that... Oh. What is it? Are you in pain? Uh, no, I, I just feel jumpy, that's all. Here we are, Mrs. Temple. Drink this. Oh, thank you. Drink it up. You. <laughs> what was in that? Dynamite? Oh, that oh. little concoction is known as the Nelson Knockout. You're telling me. Do you feel better? Much better. Good. I am awfully oh. sorry about this, Mr. Temple. But what happened? Well, I'd been trying to make up my mind to telephone you all day. I was rather worried about something, and I felt that if we could have a chat together, you might possibly be able to straighten things out for me. You see... Since I last saw you, something has happened. Something which I feel, so far as the Belasco affair is concerned, is rather important. Go on, Mr. Nelson. Oh, anyway, to get back to my story, about a quarter past four this afternoon, I strolled into the book department at Dolman's. I bought a novel and was getting my change from the assistant when, suddenly, to my surprise, I noticed Mrs. Temple staring at me across the counter. But to be perfectly frank with you, it took me two or three seconds before I actually recognised her. Hello, Mr. Nelson. Why, Mrs. Temple, do forgive me. I'm afraid I didn't recognise you. How are you? I'm quite well, thank you. And Mr. Temple? He's fine. He's not with you at the moment, I take it? No, I'm afraid not. As a matter of fact, he's getting ready to go to a cocktail party. Oh, I see. Uh, will he be in later this evening? Yes, I think so. I rather wanted to have a talk with him sometime. I don't know whether it would be convenient to come round. Why don't you call round tonight, about nine o'clock? He's almost bound to be in then. May I? Yes, of course. Thank you. Is there any message I can give him? No, I... <laughs> yes. Yes. You can tell him that I know now why my wife committed suicide. Yes. All right, Mr Nelson, I'll tell him that. Uh, can I give you a lift anywhere, Mrs. Temple? Well... It was raining rather heavily a few minutes ago. I don't know whether it still is or not. Well, actually, I'm going back to the flat. Oh, splendid. Well, that's easy. 
I don't want to take you out of your way, Mr. Nelson. <laughs> You're not, I assure you. Here, let me give you a hand with those parcels. Oh, I see you've bought a copy of Forever. That's for Charlie. It's his birthday on Tuesday and, well, you know the servant problem. Yes, yes, rather. What weather! Yes. Oh, isn't it dreadful? Uh, uh, allow me. Thank you. Oh, I'm very glad I, I, oh, I bumped into you, Mr. Nelson. I certainly don't think you'd have picked up a taxi very easily. I'm quite certain I shouldn't. I don't think it's raining quite so heavily. Uh, no, perhaps not. Oh, what time did you say, Mrs. Temple? Nine o'clock? Yes, drop in about nine. Paul's almost sure to be back by then. Good. Oh, it's, it's awfully skiddy. Oh. Uh, uh, Mrs. Temple? Yes? You remember me telling you about a woman called Mrs. Forrester? Yes. Well, I've got a shrewd suspicion that I was right. What do you mean? I've been watching her. Or rather, I've been watching her house. Huh? A young man called to see her last night. It was very late, almost 12 o'clock. When he left the house, I, uh, I followed him. Well? I discovered who he was. It's the man your husband mentioned. His name's Worth. Worth? Are you sure it was Mr. Worth? Yeah, quite sure. I followed him back to the cafe. But why should Mr. Worth visit? Oh, what is it? Are we skidding, or what is it? I don't know. No, I don't know. There seems to be something the matter with the, the steering. It won't... It won't... Pull the wheels. Do towards... something, or we shall be on the pavement. Oh, I can't stop it. It's no use. Oh, I... Where's the handbrake? Oh, for heaven's sake, be quick. Be quick, Mr. Nelson. Oh, oh. Oh. Mrs. Temple, are you all right? Yes, I... I... Are you sure? Are you sure you're all right? Yes. Can I get out of the car? Yes. I... Yes, of course. I'm sorry. Give me your hand. Uh, watch. Uh, watch your coat. Don't tear it on the glass. Are you all right yourself? Yes. Ye gods, we were lucky. What happened? Was it a skid? No. I don't think it was. It seemed to me as if the steering went to pieces. I just couldn't do anything with it. It certainly wasn't a skid. I can tell you that right now. No. I don't think it was. I saw the whole thing. I was parked over on the other side of the road. Gee, I wondered what was going to happen next. One minute, you were blissfully sailing along as if... Say, are you feeling queer? I'm feeling a little dizzy. You'd better relax. Come along, I'll take you over to my car. That's awfully nice of you, but uh, I think I'll be all right if I just, just... No, no, you go along, please. There's a lot I've got to attend to. I'll be over in a few minutes. That's my car over on the corner, the rolls. We'll be waiting for you over there, okay? Thanks very much, sir. You're welcome. By the way, were you going far? Uh, no, I was simply running this lady home to Half Moon Street. Oh, well, we'll soon take care of that. Let us know when you're ready. Uh, uh, thanks. Yes. Were you surprised, Mr. Nelson, when you found out what had happened? No. Why not? Because, before I answer that question, Temple, would you mind telling me something? That rather depends what it is. Do I strike you as being a rather frightened sort of person? The first time I met you, or rather when I met you at the Villa Rica, I got the impression that you were a particularly self-possessed sort of person. Now, however, I'm not so sure. Still, you don't exactly strike me as being frightened of anything. Nervous, perhaps, but not exactly frightened, Mr. Nelson. Well, I am frightened. What happened this afternoon with Mrs. Temple has happened before. It's not the first time. What do you mean? I mean, it's not the first time there's been an attempt on my life. That's why I wanted to get in touch with you. Go on, Mr. Nelson. After what you told me about Mary Hamilton, I made up my mind to make certain investigations myself. Investigations about what, exactly? I told you. I wanted to find out why my wife committed suicide. That's why I engaged Mary Hamilton. Hmm. Did you find out why your wife committed suicide? Yes. Well? Apparently, Rini borrowed some money from Mrs. Forrester. She was unable to repay that money, and, after a little while, Mrs. Forrester became rather, well, rather difficult about it. How do you know this? I found some letters, some letters belonging to my wife. From Mrs. Forrester? Yes. You told Mrs. Temple that Mr. Worth visited Mrs. Forrester's. Are you sure of that? Quite sure. 
I followed him back to the cafe. Was he alone? Yes. Nelson, are you under the impression that your wife didn't commit suicide? What do you mean? Do you think she was murdered? No. The coroner brought in a verdict of suicide, and I'm quite prepared to accept that verdict. What I'm not prepared to accept, however, is the general assumption that we were all washed up and that our marriage was on the rocks. In other words, you don't wish to... Excuse me. <clears throat> hello? Hello, Temple. Speaking. Forbes, yeah? Oh, hello, Sir Graham. How did you get on this evening? Oh, you mean at the cocktail party? Yes, Mrs. Forrester's. Did you see her? Uh, yes, but it wasn't quite what we expected. Oh, in what way? Well, uh... Aren't you alone? Not just at the moment. Oh, I see. I'll ring later. Well, as a matter of fact, Sir Graham, I rather wanted to see you. Tonight? No, tomorrow morning will do. Oh, all right. My office, 10.30. Is that all right? Yes, that'll do fine. Oh, and do you think you could arrange for Mr. Worth to be there? Mr. Worth? Yes, I think so. I could probably get Inspector Perry to pick him up. Is it urgent, Temple? I'd like to see him, Sir Graham. All right. He'll be there. 10.30. 10.30. Temple? Yes? Why do you think Worth went to Mrs. Forrester's? He might be a friend of hers. It seems rather a curious coincidence, doesn't it? What do you mean? Well, first of all, you heard about him from Ross Morgan, an associate of Dr. Belasco's. Then you discovered that Mary Hamilton was working at his cafe. And now, apparently... He turns out to be a friend of Mrs. Forrester's. It is rather a remarkable coincidence, darling. Do you think so? Don't mm. you? Yes, I suppose it is. Well, if you'll pardon my saying so, Mr. Temple, it seems to me that your visit to Mrs. Forrester's was something of a fiasco. You went there with the intention of finding out why exactly Harry Marx received an invitation to her cocktail party, and yet, apparently, you hesitated to ask her the question point blank. I did ask her the question point blank, Mr. Kaufman, and she gave me a point blank answer. In fact, you said quite frankly that you'd never heard of Harry Marx. Exactly. But it's nonsense. She must have heard of Marx. Did you speak to her about the other girl, the one that committed suicide? Yes. What did she say? Well, she confirmed what Mr. Nelson had already told me. Did she tell you that Mrs. Nelson had borrowed money from her? No. Did you ask her if she had? Of course I didn't ask her. No? No. You surprised me, Mr. Temple. Temple knew nothing about the money or the letters from Mrs. Forrester until he saw Nelson. And he didn't see Nelson until he returned to the flat. What is it? Uh, beg your pardon, sir. Oh, come in, Inspector. Oh, good morning, Mr. Temple. Good morning, Inspector. Mr. Worth is here, sir. Ah, ask him in. If you'll excuse me mentioning it, sir, I think I'd go a bit easy on the boy. When I picked him up this morning, he got quite panicky, sir. Perhaps it was the thought of coming to Scotland Yard. <laughs> it might have been, sir. All right, Inspector. Ask him in. Come this way, Mr. Worth. Thank you. Good morning. Oh, good morning, Sir Graham. Oh, good morning, Mr. Temple. Good morning. Do sit down, please. Thank you. Inspector Perry told me that you wanted to ask me a few questions. Also, for the life of me, I can't imagine why you should take the trouble to drag me along Mr. Here. Worth. Yes, Mr. Temple? Do you know a lady called Mrs. Forrester? Mrs. Forrester? Yes. I'm afraid I don't. Her address is 27A Barclay House Place. Well? Didn't you visit that address? Quite recently, in fact. No. You're sure? Of course I'm sure. That's a lie. What do you mean? Who is this man? My name is Kaufman. Mr. Kaufman is attached to the special branch. Well, Mr. Kaufman, for your information, I am not in the habit of telling lies. You didn't visit 27A Barclay House Place? I did not. Mr. Worth, tell me, did you know that Mary Hamilton was a private inquiry agent? Not until Inspector Perry told me. And yet Mary Hamilton was employed at your cafe as a waitress. I have several waitresses employed at my cafe, Sir Graham. But they are not, so far as I know, private inquiry agents. You know what happened the other night, I suppose? The night Sir Graham and I visited your cafe? Yes. A man called Harry Marks was murdered. I know that. Do you know why he was murdered? No. He was murdered because he was on the point of divulging the identity of Dr. Belasco. Well? You told us that Harry Marks frequently visited your cafe. I did not. I told you that he came to the cafe, well, occasionally. Did you murder Harry Marks, Mr. Worth? You come to my cafe, where I am trying my damnedest to carry on a perfectly honest and legitimate business. And you pester me. Pester me. Day and night with questions. 
I have never heard of your precious Mrs. Forrester. I don't know who Dr. Belasco is. I can't imagine why Mary Hamilton was working at my cafe. And I did not murder Harry Marks. Who did? If you want to know about Harry Marks, why don't you ask Mr. Bellamy? Mr. Bellamy? Who's Mr. Bellamy? Do you mean Ed Bellamy, the man that runs the Machicha Club? Yes. Was he a friend of Marx's? According to what I have heard, Marx bought an interest in the club. When? Oh, a little while ago. Where is the uh, Machicha Club? It's in Barclay Square. Oh, yes. Yes, I know the place. It's a sort of South American setup. The waiters are dressed as gauchos. That's it. That's the place. Hmm. So it's owned by a man called Bellamy. Will you come this way, please, sir, madam? Thank you. I rather like the look of this place, darling. It certainly looks very gay. Here we are, madam. I'm afraid this is the only table I can offer you, sir. That's all right. Uh, your waiter will be along in a few moments. Thank you. Oh, is Mr. Bellamy available? Mr. Bellamy? I think he's in his office, sir. Well, would you be kind enough to ask him if he could spare me a few moments? My name is Temple. Mr. Temple? Yes. Very good, sir. Do you think it is the same man, Paul? I should imagine it must be. It's the same name. What was he like, darling, the man who drove you back to the flat? Oh, he was about uh, 36 or 7. Very smartly dressed. Slight American accent. Tough, I suppose, in a rather pleasant sort of way. Glasses? Yes, he wore those square-looking glasses. You know the sort I mean. Hmm. If it is the same man, I take it he's got quite a reputation. Yes, he's supposed to be a pretty smart customer. Here's the waiter. Mr. Bellamy will see you, sir. Thank you. But the office is on the second floor, sir. I'll find it. I shan't be long, darling. All right. Mr. Bellamy? That's right. Come in, Mr. Temple. I hope I'm not intruding. Not at all. As a matter of fact, I had a hunch that we'd get together sooner or later. My wife tells me that you went out of your way yesterday afternoon to be particularly nice to her. I'm very grateful. Well, it wasn't difficult. She's that kind of person. You actually saw the accident, I take it? Yeah. They were pretty lucky. At one time, I really thought they'd bought it. Hmm. But I'm quite sure that you didn't drop in on me to talk about the accident. Well, no. As a matter of fact, I wanted to ask you a few questions. About Harry Marks? Yes. That's what I thought. Marks is dead. He was murdered. I suppose you know that. Sure. It's in the papers. Was Marks a business associate of yours? Kind of. He bought himself an interest in this place just before Christmas. How much did that cost him? Twelve thousand pounds. Twelve thousand pounds? That's a lot of money. It ain't hay. Mr. Bellamy. Yes? Who do you think murdered Harry Marks? You're the detective around here. Who do you think murdered him? That's more to the point. I think he was murdered by a man called Belasco. Dr. Belasco. Dr. Belasco? Yes. The name isn't entirely unfamiliar to you, I take it? Well, not entirely. You're the second guy that's mentioned it to me tonight. Oh? Who was the first? A fellow in the restaurant. He asked me to have a drink with him. What was he like? Well, I'll point him out to you. You turn that table over. What? Turn that table over. By Timothy. It's a periscope. Yeah. I like to see what's going on around here. Look, there's Mrs. Temple. Yes, I'm just watching her. Now let's turn it around and see if we can find that guy. Do you see him? No. It rather looks to me as if... No, there he is. Where? Sat over in the corner near the staircase. Do you see him? Yes. Yes, I see him all right. Who is he? His name's Joseph. He works for a woman called Mrs. Forrester. Episode 4. Mrs. Forrester is surprised. Paul Temple, the celebrated novelist and private detective, is visited by Sir Graham Forbes of Scotland Yard and by a Mr. Philip Kaufman, who is attached to the special branch. Kaufman tells Paul Temple about a notorious criminal known as Dr. Belasco. Temple promises to try and discover the identity of Belasco and during the course of his investigations makes the acquaintance of David Nelson, Henry Worth, and a certain Mrs. Forrester. Worth is the proprietor of a small cafe in Soho. One afternoon, Sir Graham receives a letter from a man known as Harry Marks. 
Marx promises to reveal the identity of Dr. Belasco, but is unfortunately murdered. A little while later, Temple and Steve visit a nightclub owned by a man known as Ed Bellamy. Bellamy is known to have been an associate of Harry Marx. Temple visits Bellamy in his private office. Was Marx a business associate of yours? Kind of. He bought himself an interest in this place just before Christmas. Oh, how much did that cost him? Twelve thousand pounds. Twelve thousand pounds? That's a lot of money. It ain't hay. Mr. Bellamy. Yes? Who do you think murdered Harry Marx? You're the detective around here. Who do you think murdered him? That's more to the point. I think he was murdered by a man called Belasco. Dr. Belasco. Dr. Belasco? Yes. The name isn't entirely unfamiliar to you, I take it? Well, not entirely. You're the second guy that's mentioned it to me tonight. Oh? Who was the first? A fellow in the restaurant. He asked me to have a drink with him. What was he like? Well, I'll point him out to you. Turn that table over. What? Just turn the table over. By Jove, what's this? Your own television system? No, a uh, periscope. I like to see what's going on around here. Uh, look, there's Mrs. Temple. Yes, I'm just watching her. Now, let's turn it round and see if we can find that guy. Do you see him? No. It rather looks to me as it... Oh, there he is. Where? Sat over in the corner near the stairway. Do you see him? Yes. Yes, I see him, all right. Who is he? His name's Joseph. He works for a woman called Mrs. Forrester. What exactly did he say to you, Mr. Bellamy? Well, he just asked me to have a drink with him. I didn't like to offend the guy, so I had a drink. How did he come to mention Dr. Belasco? He suddenly asked me if I knew him. He said it in rather a peculiar way, though, as if there was a kind of catch in it. Say, who is this Dr. Belasco, anyway? Don't you know? Well, if I knew, I wouldn't be asking you. <laughs> well, for some time now, there have been a number of small cliques, call them gangs, if you like, in the West End of London. Dr. Belasco is determined to coordinate those cliques into one body, one definite organization. With Belasco as the great white chief, I take it. Exactly. He's got some hopes. He's got more than hopes, Mr. Bellamy. What do you mean? Oh, there are signs, very definite signs, in fact, that Belasco is succeeding. This afternoon, I had a long confidential chat to Inspector Perry, who's in charge of the investigation. <laughs> I know Perry. He walks in here as if he had a season ticket. <laughs> yes. Well, what Perry doesn't know about the West End is nobody's business. He told me that the protection racket, which hardly existed in this country six months ago, is now carefully planned and efficiently organized. And it isn't only the protection racket either, Mr. Bellamy. What do you mean? Four weeks ago, a diamond necklace was stolen. It was valued at approximately a quarter of a million. Oh, I know. The Duchess of Harborough's. It was in the papers. Oh, do you know who stole the necklace? Yeah. There's only one man who could steal it. You know that as well as I do. Larry Bristol. He must have been crazy. Why? Because he'll never get rid of a necklace like that, not in a thousand years. That's just the point. I don't get you. Six months ago, Larry Bristol wouldn't have attempted a job like that, but someone quite obviously persuaded him that the necklace could be got rid of. Someone, in fact, carefully organized the whole business. Have they picked up Larry? Uh, Perry picked him up in Liverpool three weeks ago. Had he the necklace? No, but he had a very satisfactory alibi. <laughs> this Dr. Belasco seems to know all the answers. But why are you telling me all this, Mr. Temple? It makes interesting conversation, but where does it get us? Harry Marks wrote Sir Graham Forbes a letter saying that he knew the identity of Dr. Belasco. Shortly after he wrote that letter, he was murdered. Yeah. And to my way of thinking, he asked for it. I never liked Marks. I took his dough because I needed it, but I never liked the guy. Look here. You don't really think that I murdered Marks, that I'm Dr. Belasco. Are you? <laughs> sure. I'm also Betty Grable and Monty Woolley. <laughs> no, but seriously, just, just because I knew Harry Marks, you don't really think that I'm mixed up in this business. How well did you know him? Marks? Pretty well. You see, the position, so far as I was concerned, was simply this. Just before Christmas, I struck a pretty bad patch with this place. I needed money. Marks used to come here pretty often. He was a rough diamond, but he kind of liked what he called the classy setups. One night, he discovered that financially I was in hot water, and he made me a proposition. Did he interfere with you at all? What do you mean? With the running of this place. Oh, no. No, he was pretty nice about all that. Marks was friendly with a girl called Billy Chandler. Did you meet her? Why, yes. I knew Billy. She was a nice girl. That was too bad. About what happened, I mean. Yes. Well, 
If you'll excuse me, I'll be making a move. It's nice to have met you, Mr. Temple. And give my regards to the little lady. Thank you. Oh, this way, Mr. Temple. You'll find it much quicker. Hello, Steve. Oh, hello, darling. Sorry to have been so long. That's all right. Did you see Mr. Bellamy? Yes, I saw him. It's your friend, all right. He sends his regards. Somehow I had a feeling it might be. It's rather odd, though, isn't it? What do you mean? Well, it's rather odd that he should be mixed up in this business and yet turn up just when Mr. Nelson and I had the accident. Well, according to Mr. Bellamy, he's not mixed up in this business. He was a friend of Harry Marks. Yes, but I'm not sure whether that proves anything or not. Paul. Yes? When Mr. Kaufman first told us about Dr. Belasco, he told us that Belasco was starting to form the nucleus of a new organization. Well? Do you think that's true? I mean, for weeks now, there's been nothing about Belasco in the newspapers. It's true enough. And it's my firm belief that Kaufman didn't exaggerate. Good evening. Oh. Good evening, sir. I didn't expect to find you here, Joseph. No, sir. What is this, business or pleasure? Purely pleasure, sir. It's my evening off. Oh, I see. I can understand now why you make such excellent cocktails. <laughs> Obviously, you believe in getting your experience at first hand. Yes, sir. Oh, this is my wife, Joseph. Good evening, madam. Good evening. Will you excuse me, sir? Yes, of course. But give my regards to Mrs. Forrester. Yes. Yes, I will indeed, sir. Who on earth is that extraordinary individual? His name's Joseph. He works for Mrs. Forrester. What do you mean, works for her? Well, the day I arrived, he opened the door. I think he's a sort of general factotum. It's rather strange to find him in this sort of place. And that's what I thought. Did you know he was here? Yes. Bellamy pointed him out to me and apparently spoke to Bellamy earlier this evening. What about? Do you know? Yes. He asked him if he'd heard of... What is it? Who's this? Mr. Temple. Yes? May I introduce myself? My name's Cramore. Lord Cramore. Well, then. How do you do? I read a book of yours a long time ago. Something to do with a murder or something. Couldn't make head or tail of it. Always meant to ask you about it. What was it called? Ah, now you've got me. Deuce of a long time ago. Fellow pushes girl off a cliff or knocks her under a train or something. Whole thing's rather far-fetched, I thought. I trust you didn't buy a copy. No, no, no. Rather not. Borrowed it from a friend. As a matter of fact, Temple, I've... I've got rather a good idea for a detective novel myself. Perhaps we might get together sometime. Yes, we might. Well, why not later tonight? At your flat? Well, I... I could tell you the whole idea and then... Perhaps we could talk about... Dr. Belasco. What do you know about Dr. Belasco? Later, at your flat. All right. Just after 12. We'll be waiting. Ready, Steve? Yes. It's a pity we haven't got the car. I knew you'd say that. <laughs> Can you get us a cab? I very much doubt it, sir. It's all right, darling. We can walk. walk. I haven't seen a taxi for the last half hour, sir. But if you'd like to hold on a bit, I'll pop down to the end of the square. Blimey, you are lucky. Taxi! Taxi! It's OK. It's flagged up. That's a piece of luck. It certainly is, ma'am. Oh, thank you, sir. Here you are, ma'am. Thank you. Where to, sir? Tell him to drop us off at... Oh, hello. What is it, Paul? Have you seen my gloves? You had them a moment ago. Are you sure? That's funny. You don't appear to have dropped them, sir. Look in your pockets, mate. No, I... Are you sure I had them, darling? Yes, I think so. I know what's happened. I've left them in the cloakroom. Hold on a moment. I shan't be long, drive up. Yes, yeah, OK. Can't afford to lose a pair of gloves these days. It isn't just a question of the money, it's a question of the blinking coupons. Is anything the matter, sir? Where's your telephone? There's a box in the corner, sir. Just Thank you. Opposite... Hello? Hello? 
Sir Graham? Oh, hello, Temple. Are you alone? I know, I've got cow from here. Well, listen, I'm in a desperate hurry and I've got to talk fast. I'm in the Machicha Club. Steve and I are just leaving. Someone's trying to pick us up. What do you mean? In a taxi? Yes. Are you sure? I'm pretty sure. Have you got a car handy? A Kaufman has. Good. Now, listen, I'm deliberately going to fall for it, but I want you to follow us. Where is the Machichi Club? Barclay Square? Yes. Good. We'll be there in five or six minutes. Right. Uh, the number of the cab is DHO 838. Mm -hmm. Stall him for as long as you can. Yes, all right. Oh, sorry. Why, good evening, Mr. Temporal. Oh, hello, Mrs. Forrester. You appear to be in rather a hurry. Yes, I... Uh... I had to make a telephone call. So I gathered. Are you alone? No, my wife's outside. She's waiting for me. Oh. We're just leaving. Oh, what a pity. I had a feeling that I might possibly bump into you this evening. Did you? What made you think that? Oh, I don't know. Perhaps seeing Joseph here. Seeing Joseph? Yes. You appear to be surprised, Mrs. Forrester. Where is Joseph? Why, oh, here. At the Machicha. Here? Do you mean to say that Joseph is... Are you sure? I'm quite sure. I spoke to him. Well, really, this is too much. You have to pay your servants the earth these days, and then when you pay them the earth... Oh, really, this is exasperating. Shall I ask him to leave? No, you can't very well ask... <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can see the funny side of it, but really, it is annoying. Oh, well. Good night, Mr. Temple. Goodbye, Mrs. Forrester. Oh, he's taking his blinking time. Here he is, madam. Oh, good. You've been a very long time, darling. Have I? Did you find your gloves, sir? Hmm? Oh, yes. Yes, thanks very much. I dropped them in the cloakroom. Oh, you were lucky, sir. Yes. Yes, rather. Jump in, Paul. Where to? Uh, take us to... Um... Steve, how would you like to go to Pinolio's for an hour or so? Not at this time of night, darling. Oh, why not? It's early yet. No. The flat. All right. But I think you're making a terrible mistake. Half Moon Street. OK. You can drop us on the corner. Yes, you know, it's all right. Good night, sir. Oh, um, here we are. You have tipped him, Paul. Oh, have I? Oh, well. Good night. Good night, sir. Paul, what's the matter with you? What do you mean? You're dithering about like an old man. Oh, don't be silly. You comfy over there? Yes, of course I am. Darling, is anything the matter? Yes. What? This taxi was waiting for us. What do you mean? You know what I mean, darling. You mean he deliberate... Oh, nonsense. All right. We'll soon see. Paul, you... You don't really think that... Well? It was rather odd, wasn't it? He ought to take the next turning if he intends to... There you are. There you are, he's missed it. Paul, where's he taking us Your to? Your guess is as good as mine. But what are we going to do? No, it's all right, Steve. Paul, supposing he... He's going faster. Yes. <laughs> Steve, what are you taking your shoe off for? We've got to break the window. No, no, Steve, wait. I want to know where he's taking us to. But, Paul, we can't just sit here and... Darling, that's ridiculous. Steve, turn round. Look through the window at the back. Is that car following us? Yes, it's Sir Graham. What? Oh, you didn't lose your gloves. You telephoned him. That's why you went back. Yes. Who's behind all this, darling? Belasco? Yes. I wonder where we're going. He'll begin to think it's rather odd if we don't start kicking up a fuss. Sit back, darling. What are you going to do? I say. I say, I told you to go to Half Moon Street. What the devil's the idea? Do you hear me? Do you hear me? I told you to go to Half Moon Street. Now we know that you were right. Yes. He's accelerating. You know, this... He... What is it? I can't see the car behind. Oh, no. Don't say we've lost them. No, no, no there they are. Who's with Sir Graham? Philip Kaufman. You know, Steve, this business is peculiar. After I left you and went back to telephone, I bumped bang slap into Mrs. Forrester. Oh, what was that? What? That noise. It was a car backfiring. Oh. I've, I've lost my shoe, darling. I, I had it in my hand a moment ago. It, what's happening? He's swerving all over the place. What the devil's he doing? Paul, what, what's the matter? What is it? I don't know what's happened. Good, good heavens, what's he trying to do? Oh, he's pulling up. Oh, we're in the middle of the road, surely. Uh, By George, you're right. He is pulling up. He switched his engine off. No, it's stalled. What's happened, Steve? He's leaning over the wheel as if he fainted or something. Wait a minute. I can't get this confounded door open. Ah, that's it. Come on, Steve. 
I've lost my shoe somewhere. Here's Sir Graham. I don't know where my shoe is. <laughs> Hello, Sir Graham. What happened? Are you both all right? Yes, thanks. I can't imagine what happened. He suddenly started to swerve all over the place and then pulled up. I say. What is it? The driver seems to be in a pretty bad way. I should imagine he must have had a seizure. Now give me your hand, Steve. I'll help you out. Paul, I've lost my shoe. Come along, darling. That's it. Mr. <laughs> Temple, Sir Graham, come over here a moment, please. What is it, Kaufman? Take a look at this man. Look at his face. Why, oh, he's been shot. That accounts for it. That accounts for the cab suddenly swerving. Steve said she thought she heard something. I thought it was a car backfiring, but... Sir Graham, don't you see what happened? Someone must have known we were following the cab. They waited most probably in a shop doorway until the cab got level with them. But how could they know? Where did you telephone from? From the Machicha. From the call box? Yes, there was a call box in the hall. I say, we'll have to get an ambulance for this fellow. Wait a moment. I believe he's trying to say something. Is he badly hurt? Oh, darling, don't come too near. I don't want you to see him. It'll only upset you, Steve. But can't I do anything? No, no, Steve, please. Uh... Temple, he's trying to say something. What is it? I don't know. What is he trying to say? I don't know, unless... Now, look here, old man. Just relax. That's it, that's it. Uh, that's better. Now, where were you going to take us to? I was told to take you to... to yes? To take you to... Yes? To Elton. He's dead. Yes. Oh. What did you say? What was it? I was told to take you to Abelstone. Abelstone? It sounded more like Abelstone to me. Well, that's what I thought. Abelstone? Is there a place called Abelstone? Not that I know of. I wonder if that's what he said. He spoke so indistinctly, I don't know. Oh, here are two of your men, by the look of things. Yes, it's a patrol car. You right, Steve? Yes, but, Paul, I've only got one shoe, and I, I can't very well... What's going on here? Oh, good evening, Sergeant. There's been an accident. An and accident, the... you say? Is anyone hurt now? Yes, the driver's been killed. Oh, well, if you take the particular sergeant, I'll... Uh... Oh, sorry, sir, I, I didn't recognise you. Recognise? What the devil are you blathering on? Uh, oh, I, uh, I beg your pardon, Sir Graham. It's all right, Sergeant. Sergeant O'Day, sir. PC Braddock, sir. Sergeant, do you know this district very well? Why, uh, yes, sir. Do you happen to know a place called Abelsden? What sort of a place, sir? I don't know. It might be a shop, it might be a club, it might be a private house, even. Abelsden? Yes. I'm afraid I don't, sir. What about you, George? Sorry, sir. Well, do you know a person called Abelsden? A person? Yes. I'm afraid I don't, sir. Sorry, sir. What about the name Abelstone? Abelstone, sir? Yes. Does that mean anything to you? Uh, I'm afraid it doesn't, sir. Sergeant? No, sir. Hmm. Well, it rather looks to me as if we're on the wrong track. Begging your pardon, sir, but how do you spell that name? Spell it? Yes, sir. Uh, well, um... What makes you ask that? Well, I was just thinking, sir, are you quite sure the name is Abelston or Abelstone? No, we're not sure. That's just the point. This man, the taxi driver, was taking Mr. and Mrs. Temple to an unknown destination. Just before he died, he said what sounded to us remarkably like I was told to take you to Abelston. I take it the point is, sir, that you've got to find that place or person. Exactly. What's on your mind, officer? Well, the name the taxi driver said, sir, could it have been Dunn, sir? Abel Dunn? Abel Dunn? Yes, sir. No. No, I don't think so. Abel Dunn? I'm not so sure. No, neither am I. Who is Abel Dunn? He's a Welshman, sir. Only a youngest chap. He runs a small dry cleaning business in Layman Street. Layman Street? It's about half a mile from here, sir. In which direction? You were going in the right direction, sir. We've had a eye in this place for some time, sir. There's something queer going on there, but we just don't know what it is. What do you mean exactly? Something queer? Well, Dunn seems to receive an awful lot of visitors, and they don't always belong to the district, as you might say, sir. Secondly, he seems to make a great deal of money, but, well, he's not exactly interested in the business. Not in the dry cleaning business. Mm. Have you reported this matter? Uh, no, sir. But we're keeping our eyes open. Take us to this place, Braddock. Yes, sir. Stay here, Sergeant, and take charge. Oh, very good, sir. Ready, Temple? Yes. Darling, I've lost my shoe. Come along, Steve. Kaufman, you go along with Braddock. I'll take Mr. and Mrs. Temple in your car. Very good, sir. Come along, Steve. I've lost my shoe, well, Sir Graham. About Steve. I've lost my shoe. What? You lost what, darling? I've lost my shoe. You've lost your shoe? Uh, yes, darling. Your shoe? Yes, my shoe. Shoe? <laughs> Mon dieu, <laughs> but you can't have lost your it's shoe. It's ridiculous, Steve. You can't possibly... I tell you I've lost my shoe. Uh, begging your pardon, ma'am. What is it, Sergeant? Is this the article you've been troubling your head about? Why, yes, that's my... <laughs> Sergeant, you're a man after my own heart. Will you be putting it on me foot now? Uh, I will that. <laughs> <laughs> 
That's the place, sir. On the corner. Does Dunn live there? I believe so, sir. There's a small flat above the shop. The entrance to the flat's on the right, sir. Hmm. Kaufman? Yes, Sir Graham? Stay here with Mrs. Temple and Braddock. If we're not back in five minutes, you know what to do. Yes, sir. Come along, Temple. He's not in. Mm. Is the door locked? Yes, I'm afraid so. Well, that's that. Wait a minute. Hmm? Have you done it? Yes, I broke the damn key. It's, it's a nuisance. There's a narrow staircase. The flat must be at the top. Yes. Let me go first, Temple. All right. Can you see? Not too well, I'm afraid. Damn! Did you hurt yourself? No. What made you slip? I don't know. I think I put my foot on something. I. Oh, wait a minute. Yes, 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 here we are. What is it? I don't know. It feels like a piece of metal or something. Wait a minute. I'll strike a match. Temple, I believe it's... Why, yes, look. It's a cigarette lighter. It's a lighter exactly like the one you found on Ross Morgan. Let me have a look at it. What are you looking at? This is the lighter Steve had. The one I returned to David Nelson. The identical one? Yes. Are you sure? Quite sure. How do you know? Well, look. There's a tiny scratch on the corner. Near the flint. Well? I had a hunch that sooner or later this lighter would turn up again. That's why I made quite sure that when it did, I'd recognize it. What do you mean? I made this mark myself, Sir Graham. Then Nelson must have been here. It looks very much like it, unless... What was that? What? I thought I heard something. No, I don't think so. Come along, Sir Graham. Let's go upstairs. Here we are. I don't hear anything. You know, I don't think there's anyone in. No, I don't think there is. The door's locked. You sure? Yes. Oh. What is it? There's something on the doorknob. I think it's... It's blood. Get the door open. Get it open, quickly. Quickly, Sir Graham. There's another room over there. Temple. Temple. Look at this man. Just look at this man. Oh. He's been beaten up. He's been absolutely beaten up. Yes. Who is he? Do you know? His name's Lord Craymore. He spoke to me about an hour ago at the Machicha. Episode 5, David Nelson Explains. Paul Temple, the celebrated novelist and private detective, is visited by Sir Graham Forbes of Scotland Yard and by a Mr. Philip Kaufman, who is attached to the special branch. Kaufman tells Paul Temple about a notorious criminal known as Dr. Belasco. Temple promises to try and discover the identity of Belasco and during the course of certain investigations makes the acquaintance of Henry Worth, David Nelson, Mrs. Forrester, Joseph, a servant of Mrs. Forrester's, and a certain Mr. Ed Bellamy. Bellamy is the proprietor of the Machicha Club in Berkeley Square. One night, after a visit to the Machicha, Temple and Steve are abducted, and an attempt is made to take them to an address in Lehman Street. The attempt fails, however, and later the same night, Temple and Sir Graham Forbes visit the address. This turns out to be a small dry cleaners establishment, owned by a man called Abel Dunn. Temple and Forbes force an entrance and make their way up the narrow staircase to the flat which is situated above the shop. I don't think there's anyone in. No, I don't think there is. The door's locked. You sure? Yes. Oh. What is it? There's something on the doorknob. I think... It's blood. Get the door open. Get it open quickly. Quickly, Sir Graham. There's another room over there. 
Temple! Temple! Just look at this man. Just look at him. Oh. He's been beaten up. He's been absolutely beaten up. Yes. Who is he, do you know? His name's Lord Cremor. He spoke to me about an hour ago at the Machicha. Why should this happen? Why? Cremor wanted to see me, and I arranged to meet him at the flat. He said he wanted to talk about Dr. Belasco. Did he know the identity of Belasco? I don't know. Hmm. Well, there's nothing we can do for this poor devil, I'm afraid. He's had it. Yeah, I'm afraid so. Let's go back into the other room, Temple. Our friend Mr. Dunn doesn't appear to be a very tidy individual. It rather looks to me as if he left in a hurry. Yes, just what I was thinking. You know, Kaufman's right about this business. Someone must have found out about your telephone call. They knew that we were following you, and that unless something happened to prevent the driver from bringing... Well, whoever it is, they're pretty persistent. Yes. I'll take a chance on it. Governor 6891? Yes? Could I speak to Mr. Dunn, please? Who is that speaking? I'm speaking on behalf of a Mrs. Forrester. Yes? I'm given to understand that you... That is Mr. Dunn, speaking personally. Yes. Mr. Abel Dunn. Uh, yes, speaking. Well, I'm given to understand that... Yes? What's happened? He's replaced the receiver. Who was it, do you know? Yes. It's the man I told you about, Joseph. Works for Mrs. Forrester. But I thought you said you saw him at the Machicha Club. I did. As a matter of fact, I spoke to him. Are you sure it was the same man on the phone? Yes. Well, what did he say? Well, first of all, he said that he was speaking for Mrs. Forrester. Then he asked me if I was able done. When I said that I was, he said, I'm given to understand that you... And then he stopped. Obviously, he must have guessed that something was the matter. I wonder what he wanted. I don't know. You know, Temple, Braddock must have been right. This is the place that taxi driver intended to bring you to. Listen. Otherwise... There's someone coming up the stairs. Yes. I wonder if it's Kaufman. No. No, I don't think it is. Stand by the door, Temple. Yes, all right. He's at the door. Yes. Don't touch it. Stand back! This time, my friend, I've come under slightly different circumstances. Good evening, Mr. Worth. Oh, Sir Graham, what does this mean? What's happened? Where's done? Mr. Tempest. Drop the gun. Drop it. What are you doing here? What's more to the point, what are you doing here? I came to see Mr. Dunn. Had you an appointment? No, but... Yeah, I'm not talking. I'm not saying a word. Not until I've seen my solicitor. Was Abel Dunn a friend of yours? You heard what I said. I'm not talking. Was Abel Dunn a friend of yours? Was he? No. Why did you come here? Why did you come here? I, I was told to come here by Dr. Belasco. When? About ten days ago. Go on. <clears throat> Mr. Worth, the last time I saw you, I asked you about a woman called Mrs. Forrester. You told me that you'd never been to her house and that you'd never even heard of her. And yet, in spite of this... Yeah, Mr. Temple, you've got to believe me. Please, you, you've got to believe me. I, I came here tonight because... Just over a, a week ago, I received a telephone call. I was told that unless I delivered 200 pounds to this address, my cafe would be smashed to pieces and my business taken away from me. You delivered the money? Oh, yes. I was frightened. I, I came here one afternoon. To the flat? No, to the shop down below. I saw a man called Abel Dunn. He was expecting me. And I handed over the 200 pounds. Was Dunn the man you spoke to on the telephone? No, I don't think so. Go on. After I'd handed over the money, I realized what a coward and what a complete fool I'd been. I made up my mind that the next time I heard from Belasco, I'd threaten to expose him, unless he returned the 200 pounds. How could you expose him? What do you mean? Who is Dr. Belasco? Why, obviously, this man done, the, the man who took the 200 pounds. You think so? But he must be. Is that why you came here tonight? Belasco, or one of his men, telephoned me last night. I was told to bring a hundred pounds. To this address? Yes. Tonight? Uh, no. I was supposed to have brought the money first things this morning. Well, I didn't. Instead, you came here tonight, complete with this little weapon, in order to try and get back your two hundred. Uh, yes. You expect us to believe that story? I don't care whether you believe it or not. It's the truth. Hmm. Well, it seems to me, Mr. Worth... What's that? Mr. Graham, 
Mr. Temple. Are you all right? It's Kaufman and Braddock. We saw Worth arrive, sir, so we thought we'd better see if you were all right. We're all right. But I'm afraid our mysterious friend, Mr. Dunn, hasn't put in an appearance. No, and I don't think he will either, Sir Graham. Not tonight. Why do you say that? Tell them. There's been an emergency call from the yard, sir. Well? A lorry was stolen from Fenchurch Street about three quarters of an hour ago. The description of the driver fits Abel Dunn to a T. What was on the lorry? Cigarettes. Cigarettes? Three and a half million of them, Mr. Temple. Seventeen thousand pounds worth. Why, Timothy, seventeen thousand? Well, didn't I tell you? Didn't I tell you that Dunn was Dr. Belasco? <laughs> Why are you laughing? Stupidity always makes me laugh, my friend. Especially when it is assumed stupidity. What do you mean? You know perfectly well what I mean. Belasco's behind this business, we know that. But he didn't drive the lorry, my friend. How do you know? Because I'm pretty sure that Mr. Dunn drove the lorry, and Mr. Dunn is not, I assure you, Dr. Belasco. Incidentally, Mr. Worth, what exactly are you doing here tonight? I've already explained my presence here to Sir Graham. <laughs> Have you? I feel sure that what your explanation lacked in conviction, it made up in originality. Why do you think Mr. Worth came here tonight? Isn't it obvious? What do you mean, Calvin? Worth knew about the lorry. Even if he isn't Belasco, it's quite obvious that he helped to plan the whole business. That's a lie! That's a filthy, dirty lie! No, sir, no, sir, none of that, sir. I've only seen this man once in my life. That was the time I told you about. The time I handed over the 200 pounds. Did you see Dunn alone on that occasion? Yes. Quite alone? Yes, he was alone, but... But what? I was just thinking. Well... After I'd handed over the 200 pounds, he told me to go. I went outside into the corridor, but instead of going straight into the road, I stood by the door, listening. Well? He made a telephone call, a personal call to a man called Alan. You don't remember the number? Uh, yes. It was a trunk call. Greenchurch 87. Greenchurch 87? Yes. What is it, Braddock? Well, that, that, that's the Cromwell Hart, sir. The Cromwell Hart? Well, it's a pub, uh, an inn, sir, at Greenchurch. Do you know the place? Well, I ought to, sir. I was born pretty well next door to it. Where is Greenchurch? About 18 miles from Willsborough, on the Romney Marshes. And, uh, that's right, sir. This telephone conversation, Mr. Worth, that you so conveniently overheard. Yes. Well, what was the gist of it? Dunn simply informed this man, Alan, that I had delivered the 200 pounds. That's all he said? That's all I heard him say, Mr. Kaufman. Mm -hmm. What sort of place is this Green Church? Well, it's just a fair-sized village, sir. I wonder if Belasco's got a hideout down there, and that's where they've taken the lorry. That's just what I was thinking. I've a good mind to contact the yard and send Perry down. Braddock. Yes, sir. Are you well known in that part of the world? Green Church, sir. Yes. Oh, no, sir. You see, I've been away for years. But you know the district? Well, like the palm of my hand, sir. Who's in charge of your division? Inspector Copthorne, sir. Good. I'll get Perry to speak to Copthorne first thing tomorrow. Meanwhile, change into plain clothes and get down to Greenchurch. Keep your wits about you and your eyes open. If you see anything out of the ordinary, report direct to the yard. Very good, sir. Report to Mr Kaufman or Inspector Perry. You understand? Yes, sir. I understand, sir. Good evening, sir. Hello, Charlie. I'll take the coat, Mom. Oh, thank you. Any messages? Uh, Mr Nelson's here, sir. He's in the lounge, sir. Mr Nelson? How long has he been here? Oh, uh, only about two or three minutes. Seems in a bit of a stew with himself. Huh. Would you like me to get you any sandwiches or something? Uh, no, thank you, Charlie. Hello, Nelson. Ah, oh, good evening, sir. Uh, hello, Mrs Temple. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. I'm sorry bursting in on you like this. Please, forgive me. Is anything the matter, Mr Nelson? Yes. I'm afraid I've had rather an unfortunate experience. Don't tell me you've had another motor car accident. Uh, no, it's nothing like that, Temple, but... Well, uh, as a matter of fact, I've had my flat burgled. Your flat burgled? Yes. When? Well, sometime this afternoon. It must have happened between ooh, half past three and five o'clock. You told the police? Yes, of course, naturally. Ah. I see what you mean. You're wondering why I've taken the trouble to come along here. Well, as a matter of fact, Temple, the whole business is rather odd. You see, the place was quite obviously ransacked, and yet very little was stolen. 
It almost looks to me as if they were searching for something. What did they take? A, a wallet, rather a nice wallet, as a matter of fact, a pair of gold cufflinks and a small bedroom clock. That's all? Yes. Yes, that's all. Oh, and a cigarette lighter. Your cigarette lighter? Yes. It's the one my wife had. You remember, the one that Mrs. Temple borrowed. Yes, I remember. Hmm. Why do you think this business is rather odd, Mr. Nelson? <laughs> Well, don't you think it is? No, there's quite a lot of this sort of thing going on just now. It's not exactly unique. <laughs> yes, but surely... Yes? Well, uh, I was going to say, surely you believe there's a connection between what happened this afternoon and the Belasco affair. Why should I believe it? <laughs> surely... Temple, don't you realise that since Mary Hamilton was murdered, since I decided to take a personal interest in this affair, there have been two attempts on my life, two definite attempts. Nelson. Yes? Supposing we put our cards on the table. What do you mean? Supposing you tell me exactly what you think happened this afternoon. All right. I think my flat was broken into by Mrs. Forrester, or someone acting on Mrs. Forrester's behalf. I believe that that person was told to get the letters that Mrs. Forrester wrote to my wife. I believe, quite frankly, that Mrs. Forrester is the person you're looking for, the notorious Dr. Belasco. Well, that's frank enough. Now I'll be frank with you. Here's your cigarette lighter. How on earth? Do you mean to say... Is this a joke? Isn't it your lighter? Of course it's my lighter. You know perfectly well it is. You searched my flat. You broke into my flat this afternoon and... <laughs> Do you really think that's what happened, Mr Nelson? Well, if it isn't, where did you get the lighter from? I found it. Or rather, Sir Graham Forbes found it. Where? At Mr Dunn's. Who the devil is Mr. Dunn? He's the proprietor of a small dry cleaning establishment in Layman Street. You must forgive me if I appear a little bewildered, Temple, but quite frankly, I can't make head nor tail of this. We found your lighter on a staircase leading up to a flat occupied by a certain Mr. Abel Dunn. We assumed, not unnaturally, that you had visited Mr. Dunn and accidentally dropped your lighter. But I've never even heard of the man. Just a minute. Look here. You can see what's happened. This is the man Mrs. Forrester engaged, the, the man who broke into the flat. When he found that he couldn't find the letters, he grew desperate and decided to help himself. To the cigarette lighter, the wallet and the clock. Exactly, Mrs. Temple. Uh, you didn't see the wallet, I suppose, or the clock? No, and if we had, we shouldn't have known they were yours. Ah, no, no, of course not. Temple, why did you visit this man Dunn in the first place? Because we had reason to believe... He's mixed up in the Belasco affair. Yes. Well, there's your answer. He's the man who broke into my flat, all right. Catch Mr. Dunn at... Oh, I presume you haven't caught him? Not yet. Well, catch Mr. Dunn, and to my way of thinking, you've got the key to the whole situation. Ten to one, he'll double-cross Mrs. Forrester and confess. To your way of thinking, we've got Dr. Belasco. Exactly. Hmm. Well, how would you like a drink, Mr. Nelson? Uh, no, thanks. I must be off. As a matter of fact, I feel I'm making rather a nuisance of myself. <laughs> Nonsense. It's all right, Paul. I'll answer it. Uh, uh, goodbye, Mrs. Temple. Oh, goodbye, Mr. Nelson. Hello. Mayfair 1784? Yes. Uh, hold the line, please. Mr. Bellamy wants you. Hello there. Hello? Mr. Bellamy? Mrs. Temple? Yes. How are you? I'm very well, Mr. Bellamy. Thank you. How are you? I'm swell. Sorry I didn't get a chance to have a chat with you tonight, Mrs. Temple, but, well, you know how it is. I know. Do you want Paul? Yes. I I'd rather like to have a word with him, if it's convenient. Hold on a moment. It's Mr. Bellamy. Bellamy? <clears throat> Hello? Bellamy? Hello, Temple. I'm sorry to disturb you. That's all right. What can I do for you? Well, a rather curious thing happened after you left the club, Mr. Temple. I thought perhaps you might like to hear about it. Yes? You remember that man we talked about? The man who asked me about Dr. Belasco? Mm, yeah, I remember. Well, shortly after you left, he was joined by a friend of his, a woman. I inquired who she was, and I was told that... Yes? I was told that she was Mrs. Forrester. Well? Well, didn't you tell me that he worked for Mrs. Forrester? Yes. <laughs> nice work if you can get it. What do you mean? Well, they seem to get on like a house on fire, laughing and talking... You sure you haven't got hold of the wrong end of the stick? The wrong end of the stick? Yeah, I mean, you sure they're not engaged or something? Bellamy, tell me, did Mrs. Forrester go straight across to his table? She sure did. 
and boy, was he glad to see her. Hmm. What time did they leave? They're still here. You sure? Sure, I'm sure. As a matter of fact, I can see them right now. They're dancing together. Dancing together? Yeah, that's what I mean. Okay, Bellamy, thanks for ringing. You're welcome. Oh, M Mr. Temple. Yes? This guy, Joseph. Well? He wouldn't be Dr. Belasco, by any chance. <laughs> Your guess is as good as mine, Mr. Bellamy. Okay. Goodbye. Goodbye. What did he want? Hmm? I said, what did he want, darling? Yes, that's just the point. What did he want? Open the door, Richard. Dun, dun, bum, bum. Dun, open the door, Richard. Paul? What is it? Sir Graham's here. I can't hear you. Paul, turn the tap off. Sir Graham's here. Oh. What does he want? Do you know? I think he wants to have a word with you about that man Braddock, the, the young fellow that went down to Green Church. Oh. Uh, well, uh, you better send him in here. <laughs> yes. All right. <laughs> <clears throat> Can I come in? Oh, yes. Come in, Sir Graham. I could have waited until you'd had your bath, Temple. No, no need for you to wait. Sit down. Thanks. Temple, you know that young fellow I sent down to Green Church the day before yesterday? Yes. Well, I got a rather peculiar telegram from him this morning. Quite frankly, I don't know what to make of it. What's it say? Well, here it is. Uh, no, you read it, Sir Graham. It was handed into Green Church just after eight o'clock this morning. It says... Important development. Suggest you or Mr. Temple meet me here, Britannia Cafe, 345, Braddock. That's all? Yes. Where did he send it to? The yard? No. As a matter of fact, he sent it to my private address. Hmm. Where's Constable Braddock staying? The Cromwell Hart? Yes. He's staying there under the name of Bennett. Have you mentioned this telegram to Kaufman or Inspector Perry? Not yet. I can't imagine why he didn't send it to Kaufman in the first place. Hmm. Pass the towel. <laughs> well... What do you suggest we do? Oh, there's only one thing we can do, Sir Graham. Go down to Green Church. Go down to Green Church. Yes, I did. Another cake, darling? No, thank you. Sir Graham? No, thank you, Steve. What time do you make it? It's nearly five. Mm. He's not going to show up. I'm afraid not. I wonder... Yes? Oh, I was just thinking. I wonder what we'd better do. I don't know. You don't think Braddock left a message for us? Here? Well, actually, I was thinking of the inn. No, he didn't leave a message at the inn. I asked when he arrived. Well, do you think he left a message here? I don't whether he'd do that. Well, if he did, he'd probably leave it at the cash desk downstairs. Go down, Steve. Buy some biscuits or cakes or something. If and... I can get them. <laughs> <laughs> and make a sort of... Casual inquiry. Don't seem too concerned about it. I know, darling. The name's Bennett, Steve. Yes. I shan't be long. Could I have some of those cakes, please? I'm sorry, madam. They're for the cafe only. Well, have you any biscuits? Uh, I'm afraid we haven't any sweet... Oh, excuse me. Good afternoon, Mrs. Forrester. Good afternoon. Your parcel's ready for you, madam. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Are you staying down here for long this time, Mrs. Forrester? Oh, I really don't know. Perhaps a week or ten days, rather depends on the weather. Thank you. Will you put that down to me? Oh, of course. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, madam. Now, you wanted some biscuits? Please. Does that lady live near here? Uh, Mrs. Forrester? Yes. She's a house outside Green Church on the Willsborough Road. It's a lovely place. You must have seen it. Camberley Lodge. Oh, yes. I, I believe my husband pointed it out to me on the way down from town. <laughs> Will these be all right, madam? I'm afraid they're the only biscuits we have left. Mm, yes. They'll do nicely. Thank you. <laughs> oh, by the way, we expected to meet a friend of ours here, a, a Mr. Bennett. I don't know whether he'd left a message or not. I don't think so, madam. Oh, well, doesn't matter. How much is that? One and a penny, please. Thank you. And your ration book? Oh, <laughs> yes, I was forgetting all about the book. <laughs> I don't see any reason for being suspicious, Sir Graham. But the fact remains, Braddock must have discovered something. Otherwise, he would never have sent that telegram. Hmm. Oh, here's Steve. And she looks pretty excited about something. Hello, Steve. Any luck? What's happened? Braddock didn't leave a message, 
But... Yes? You know that woman, darling, Mrs. Forrester? Yes. What about her? She's got a house down here, just outside Greenchurch, a place called Camberley Lodge. She has, has she? She was downstairs just now. I nearly bumped into her. I wonder if that's what Braddock discovered. Hmm. We'll go back to the inn. If there's no sign of Braddock by nine o'clock, we'll call on Mrs. Forrester. We can't have much further to go now. No. Sir Graham, are you coming up to the house with us or staying in the car? <laughs> As it's a social call, I think I'd better stay in the car, Temple. All right. Here we are, darling. Well, that must be the place, over on the left. We'll park the car here and walk up the drive. Give us a quarter of an hour, Sir Graham, then if you don't hear from us... I'll storm the Bastille here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right, Steve? Yes. Uh, it'll take us about three or four minutes to get up the drive. You'd better make it 20 minutes, Sir Graham. All right, Temple. Come along, Steve. We should be near the house by now, surely. I think it's just round the next bend. It's much darker than I thought it would be. All these trees and bushes. Listen. What is it? Shh. I don't hear Shh. anything. Oh, sounds like an owl or something. Yeah, maybe. Mm. You're cold, Steve? No, it's not that, darling. It... Nervous? Well, not exactly nervous. I do. But... Paul. Yes? I've been thinking about this business, and you know, there's something I don't quite understand. There's a great deal I don't understand, Steve. For one thing, if that taxi driver, the poor devil that was shot, intended to take us to Abel Dunn's, that... Paul, what is it? That isn't an owl, Steve. I'm sure it isn't. What? Don't you hear it? No. Darling, listen. Paul, there isn't anything. Honestly, Steve, dear, listen. I... What was that? Now, do you hear it? Do you hear it? Yes. Paul. Paul, what is it? Francis Doveridge. Episode 6. Steve's Intuition. Paul Temple is visited by Sir Graham Forbes of Scotland Yard and by a Mr. Philip Kaufman, who is attached to the special branch. Kaufman tells Temple about a notorious criminal known as Dr. Belasco. Temple promises to try and discover the identity of Belasco and during the course of investigations makes the acquaintance of Henry Worth, David Nelson, Mrs. Forrester, Joseph, a servant of Mrs. Forrester, and a certain Mr. Ed Bellamy. Late one night, Temple and Steve, together with Sir Graham Forbes, visit Camberley Lodge, which is a large country house owned by Mrs. Forrester. Sir Graham remains in the car whilst Temple and Steve proceed towards the house on foot. Paul, what is it? That isn't an owl, Steve. I'm sure it isn't. What? Don't you hear it? No. Darling, listen. What was that? Now do you hear it? Yes. What is it? Paul, what is it? I don't know. Come on, Steve. Let's go up to the house. The door's open. Yes. But don't go in without... Listen. Did you hear it? Yes. Where's it coming from? I don't know. But it's certainly not coming from the house. It sounds to me as if it's coming from over the other side, near those bushes. Mm. What are you doing? I'm just looking at the step, darling. It's blood. Yes. Paul, what do you think's happened? Shh, shh, someone coming. Who is it? Who is it, Joseph? Hello? Who is that? Good evening, Mrs. Forrester. Why, it's Mr. Temple. Well, this is a surprise. What on earth are you doing down here? I came down to see a friend of mine, or rather an acquaintance. A Mr. Bennett. Bennett? Yes, he's staying at the Cromwell Heart. Quite by chance, I heard that you've got a house down here, so... Oh, I beg your pardon. Uh, this is my wife. Oh, how do you do? <laughs> well... Weren't you in the cafe this afternoon? <laughs> yes. Oh, <laughs> no doubt that's how you discovered this. Mrs. Forrester. Yes, what is it, Joseph? The door, madam. And what about the... Why, it's open. 
Did you open the door, Mr Temple? No. But, Joseph, what is it? Look at the step. Look, there's blood on it. <gasps> How long have you been here? About two minutes. Was the door open when you arrived? I've already told you I didn't open the door, Mrs Forrest. But, no, I don't understand. I'm quite sure that we didn't leave the door open, and yet... Joseph, go into the house and see that everything's all right. Aren't there any other servants in the house? No. Apart from Joseph, I only employ a man and his wife and a girl of 16, and they're spending the evening at Willsborough. They won't be back until much later. Go along, Joseph. Uh, would you like me to come with you? Well, if you wouldn't mind, sir. Uh, come along. Uh, we shan't be long. This is all rather bewildering. Have you been away from the house for long? What do you mean? Oh, I see. Uh, about half an hour, I should say. We walked down to a cottage of mine. It's about half a mile from the main gate. Oh, yes, I believe I noticed it. It's a rather pretty little cottage with a thatched roof. It, that's right. Hmm. It's occupied by an old man called Bert Travers. He used to work on the estate, oh, donkeys years ago, when my father owned the place. After you left him, you came straight back here? Why, yes, of course. That must have been about 10 or 15 minutes ago? Possibly a little longer. I suppose Mr. Travis could verify that. Of course he could verify it, if you consider it necessary, Mrs. Temple. I've got a feeling that it may be necessary, Mrs. Forrester. What do you mean? Mrs. Forrester? What's happened? There's someone in the shrubbery. Mr. Temple drew back the curtains in the lounge and we could see him. Paul? There's someone at the back of the house. It rather looks as if the poor devil's been knocked out. That must have been the noise we heard. He must have been trying to shout for help. Mr. Temple, this blood on the step. Yes, Joseph? Well, it looks as if whoever was hurt must have been taken through the front door and out of the house. But that's impossible, quite impossible. Why is it impossible? Well, did you take anyone out of the house tonight, Mrs. Forrester? No, of course we didn't. Did we, Joseph? Why, no, madam. All right. Come along, Joseph. Let's go round to the back of the house. Steve, stay with Mrs. Forrester, please. The window is over on the left, sir. Where? Oh, yes, I see. Well, we want to be a little more this way, I think. Yes, sir. There's a hedge just over on the right. Mind your face on that branch, sir. Look. Look, sir. Yes, I see him. Oh, horrible. Oh, Lord. What's happened to him? Obviously, he's been beaten up by someone and then apparently dragged here. Is he dead? Yes. Who is he, sir? Do you know? His name's Braddock. I still maintain, Sir Graham, that until you find Abel Dunn, or the lorry for that matter, you can't possibly justify that statement. Don't let's confuse the issue, Temple. I sent Braddock down to Greenchurch because I was under the impression that Dunn had taken the lorry there and was going to contact Velasco. Now Braddock must have discovered something, something of supreme importance. Mm. Otherwise he wouldn't have been murdered. Exactly. And what do you think he discovered? Isn't it obvious? He discovered that Mrs. Forrester was Dr. Velasco. But you've had your men down there for two days. You've been over the district with a tooth comb. And you still haven't found any sign of the lorry or the elusive Mr. Dunn. Nevertheless, I still think the lorry's down there. Hmm. What do you think, Kaufman? I'm still suspicious of our friend Mr. Worth. But at the moment, I must confess, I'm strongly inclined to agree with Sir Graham. After all, this isn't one of your detective novels. What do you mean? Well, just because Mrs. Forrester appears to be so obviously guilty, it doesn't necessarily mean that she's innocent. In other words, you agree with Sir Graham? I do. Well, whether you agree or not, I've taken the necessary steps. What steps? I've sent Perry down to Greenchurch. He went down first thing this morning. I've arrested Mrs. Forrester for the murder of Norman Braddock. For the murder of Braddock? Oh, good heavens, Temple. You're not going to tell me she didn't murder Braddock. She murdered Braddock. I'm certain of that. What makes you so certain, Mr. Kaufman? <laughs> but it is so obvious. I agree. Look, as soon as he arrives at Greenchurch, Braddock discovers that Mrs. Forrester is living in the district. He makes discreet inquiries, and then one day, the day after you and Sir Graham decide to go down there, he suddenly decides to visit the house. What do you call it? Camberley Lodge. He is discovered searching the house, presumably by Mrs. Forrester and Joseph. He is beaten up. By Mrs. Forrester? Well, by the two of them. Then, when it is dark, they take him outside and dump him in the shrubbery. It's my contention that they were actually doing this when you and Mrs. Temple arrived at the house. Hmm. But don't you see? It fits together. It fits together like a jigsaw puzzle. For instance, when you and Mrs. Temple arrived at the house, the door was open. Now, if Mrs. Forrester and Joseph were just at the back of the house, as I suspect, then they'd leave the door open. It would be more or less the natural thing to do. Yes, but just a minute, Calvin. We checked the alibi. They really did visit the cottage. Maybe so, but that doesn't necessarily prove anything. Well, I've got an alternative theory. 
and incidentally one which I've expounded before, Sir Graham, under rather similar circumstances. The Rayburn case? Yes. Now, supposing Braddock was murdered not by Mrs. Forrester or Joseph, but by someone else, someone who wanted to throw suspicion, or shall we say, continue to throw suspicion, onto Mrs. Forrester. I'm listening. And supposing that person deliberately took Braddock down to Camberley Lodge. Go on. When they arrived at the house, it was empty, Mrs. Forrester and Joseph being at the cottage. Well? Well, supposing that person opened the front door with a pass key and dumped Braddock in the hall. <laughs> but he wasn't found in the hall. He was found in the shrubbery. Of course he was. What do you mean? I mean that when Braddock was left at Camberley Lodge, he wasn't dead. He got up, opened the front door, instinctively left it open, and then staggered out onto the drive. It was getting dark, the poor devil was frightened. He made his way round to the back of the house and collapsed in the shrubbery. And you expect us to believe, Mr. Temple, that the person that murdered Braddock... Dr. Belasco. Dr. Belasco. You expect us to believe that Dr. Belasco, by sheer coincidence, had a pass key to Mrs. Forrester's house. <laughs> That's stretching the imagination too far, my friend. No. It was Mrs. Forrester, assisted by Joseph, who murdered Braddock. I'm absolutely certain of that. Well, I'm delighted to hear you say so, Kaufman. There's nothing I like better than to hear a man say he's absolutely convinced about something. So Mrs. Forrester, aided and abetted by the amiable Joseph, murders Braddock and, instead of taking him for a nice long ride, dumps him, more or less, on her own front doorstep. What is it, Sergeant? I beg your pardon, sir, but uh, Mr. Bellamy's called, sir. He'd rather like a word with Mr. Temple. Bellamy? Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Ed Bellamy. Isn't that the man at the Machicho Club? Yes. Have you any idea what he wants, Temple? I haven't the slightest idea. Hmm. Ask him, Sergeant. Oh, very good, sir. Bellamy? Oh, yes, of course. The car accident. Steve and David Nelson. <clears throat> Mr. Bellamy, sir. Come in, Mr. Bellamy. Oh, thanks. Oh, hello, Temple. Hello, Bellamy. What can I do for you? Well, I telephoned your flat, and your wife told me that you were at Scotland Yard, so, well, I guess that kind of sort of made up my mind for me. What do you mean? I've been trying to make up my mind to come see you for the last 12 hours, Sir Graham, but, well... You thought you'd compromise by seeing me? Yeah, that's just about it. What did you want to see Mr. Temple about? Well, n now look, let's get this straight. I don't like a guy who goes around shooting his mouth. There are times when, well kind of pays to talk first and think afterwards. What's on your mind, Mr. Bellamy? Uh, may I sit down? Uh, yes, of course. Last night, at about quarter past eight, I was... Sorry, just a moment. Who is this? My name is Kaufman. Mr. Kaufman is attached to the special branch. Kaufman? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I remember now. You came to the club one night, about three weeks ago. Did I? Sure. You danced with a tall, blonde, rather good-looking girl. You appear to have an excellent memory, Mr. Bernie. I get by. You were saying? Oh, yeah. Uh, last night, somewhere around about quarter past eight, I was in the club, strolling around, saying hello to the folks, having a few drinks. You know how it is. And suddenly, one of the waiters came up to me. Excuse me, Mr. Bellamy. Yes, Andros, what is it? Are you expecting anyone, sir? Expecting anyone? What do you mean? Uh, there's a young gentleman, sir. He, he went upstairs into your office a few moments ago. Into my office? Yes, sir. <laughs> you must be mistaken. No, sir. I watch him most particularly. He walked up the stairs straight into the office. Do you know Inspector Perry? There was no Inspector Perry, sir. You're sure? I'm quite sure, sir. Yes. Okay, Andrews. Thank you, sir. I don't know whether you know it or not, brother. That's my desk you're sitting at. It's an extremely nice desk, Mr. Bellamy. You are a man after my own heart. What do you mean? I am referring to your impeccable taste. This office, for instance. What's the matter with it? Well, there is nothing the matter with it. Always providing, of course, that you like this sort of thing. Listen, brother, when I go in for small talk, it's usually with dames. Now, what's this all about? Your partner in this business. The late partner? Mr. Partner? I've got no partner. I've never had a partner. I am referring to the late Mr. Harry Marks. <laughs> Marks invested 12,000 pounds in this place, but that didn't make him a partner. No? No. Oh, you surprise me, Mr. Bellamy. I'm thinking you'll get a lot more surprises before we're through. <laughs> However, shall we continue? Your partner, 
your associate, the late Mr. Harry Marks, entered into negotiations with a certain Dr. Belasco. Dr. Belasco? Yes. What sort of negotiations? It was agreed that Marx, or rather you, or shall we say the Machicha Club... You say what you like, but get to the point. It was agreed that the Machicha Club would purchase certain commodities from Dr. Belasco. Commodities which could not be readily obtained in the uh, legitimate market. What are you selling? At the moment, cigarettes. <laughs> cigarettes? Well, the... Say, I read about that. 17,000 pounds worth, huh? This guy Belasco's got plenty of nerve. Mr. Bellamy. Yes? Take this piece of paper. What is it? Take it. Kennington Cottage, Ryford, Kent. What is this? You are requested to bring 900 pounds in cash to that address tomorrow night. Be there by 10 o'clock. Certainly not later than 10.15. You understand? 900 pounds? You crazy. Arrangements will be made for the delivery of the cigarettes as soon as now the just a minute. Paid. You listen to me, my fancy friend. You tell this doctor, Dr. Livingstone, whatever the hell they call the guy, that I give the orders around here. And that Harry Marks or nobody else was in a position to negotiate a deal without my consent. When I want cigarettes or whiskey or any other god darn thing, I know where to get it without contacting Dr. Velasco. Mr. Bellamy. Yeah. No doubt you heard about the Silver Club. Of course I heard. It was in the papers. They had a fire and the whole place was burned down to... A most regrettable incident. Are you threatening me, Mr... Worth. Henry Worth. Are you threatening me, Mr. Worth? Because by heck, if you are... I am purely suggesting that you do precisely as you are told. 900 pounds. 10 o'clock tomorrow night. The address is on the piece of paper, Mr. Bellamy. Well, I didn't quite know what to do about it. Then suddenly it occurred to me that the most sensible thing to do was to go along and have a chat with Mr. Temple. Surely the most obvious thing to do was to come straight to Scotland Yard. Well, I never do the most obvious thing, Mr. Calvin, on principle. Have we the piece of paper he gave you? Here it is. It won't tell you much, I'm afraid. It's typed. Kennington Cottage, Ryford, Kent. Hmm. Bellamy, you say that Worth was very self-possessed, extremely sure of himself, in fact. Extremely? Did he give you the impression that he himself was Dr. Belasco? I don't know. No. No, I don't think he did. As a matter of fact, I don't quite know why, but I rather got the impression that Dr. Belasco was a woman. What gave you that impression? I don't know. You know how it is. A person talks, they say something in a particular way. They make a certain kind of gesture. Well, it isn't so much what they say as how they say it. I know what you mean. And I think you're right, Bellamy. I think Dr. Belasco is a woman, and I think that woman is Mrs. Forrester. Mrs. Forrester? Yes, Mr. Bellamy. Yes? Supposing I suggested that Worth deliberately went out of his way to convey the impression that Dr. Belasco was a woman, how would that strike you? Well, seems to me that if that was at the back of his mind, he'd have played it up a bit more. You know what I mean, subtle but mysterious references to the little lady behind the scenes. Mm, don't you think that would have been a little too obvious? Well, maybe, maybe. You haven't said anything to anyone else about this? Not a word. Right, Bellamy. We'll pick you up tonight at the club shortly after eight o'clock, and I advise you... What do you mean, pick me up? You want me to keep that appointment, is that it? That's it, Mr. Bellamy. But surely... Why, oh, hello, Perry. Good morning, Sir Graham. You've been quick, Perry. I never dreamt that... What is it? Is something the matter? Yes. Well, what is it? Speak up, man. Mrs. Forrester and Joseph left Greenchurch by car shortly after seven o'clock this morning. Just outside Mainstone, the car skidded and... And what? Joseph escaped with a mere shaking. It was nothing short of a miracle. And Mrs. Forrester? Mrs. Forrester is dead. Dead? <laughs> but this is ridiculous. Who identified the body? I did, Sir Graham. What a night. It's simply teeming down. Can you see all right, Inspector? It's not, it's not too bad. Did you check up on this place? Yes, we checked up on it. Well, how far is it? It's about four miles the other side of Staplehurst. Well, the sooner we get there, the better. Nervous, Mr. Bellamy? Nervous? I'm like a jelly in a high wind. There's no need to be nervous. Just play the whole thing perfectly straight. I don't know. I don't trust these guys. All you've got to do is to deliver the money and convey the impression that you intend to do exactly as you're told. I'm not very good at conveying that sort of impression. Don't worry. You'll get by, all right? 
We're coming into Staplehurst, sir. Yes. You'd better take over, Bellamy. Let me get through Staplehurst. Yes, okay. <laughs> this is what I call real movie weather. What do you mean? Well, when it rains in the pictures, it's usually like this. It never rains, but it pours. <laughs> <laughs> Sir Graham? Yes? You don't think that, now that Mrs. Forrester is dead, we're on a wild goose chase? No, I don't. I'm convinced that Mrs. Forrester was Dr. Belasco. But I'm equally convinced that someone will turn up at the cottage. And I've got a shrewd idea that that... What is it, Perry? I think we turn here, sir. Y yes, there's the signpost. You turn to the left. Ah, yes, I see. Slow down, Inspector. Uh, you'd better take over now, Bellamy. Yes, okay. Shall I stay in the front of the car, sir? No. You'd better sit at the back with us, Perry. And keep well down, just in case they planted a lookout on one of the roads. Here we are, Sir Graham. There's someone there. There's a light in the cottage. Yes. Now, you know what to do, Bellamy. Just keep your nerve and play the whole thing perfectly straight. Don't be too easy going or they'll be suspicious. Be tough, but, well, give in. Okay. I'll do the best I can. I shouldn't forget the briefcase, Mr. Bellamy. What? Oh, gee, I mustn't forget that. Good luck. Thanks. Can you see him? Yes. He's nearly at the cottage. I'll get out and wipe the windscreen and then we'll be in No! Us. Don't get out of the car, Perry. Just in case there's anyone watching. Oh, sir. Where the devil did that come from? It came from the cottage. Yes. Bellamy must have heard it and... Yes. Look, he's running up to the cottage. Hello. He's looking through the window. What's he doing? He's waving to us. I don't think he is. Oh, yes, yes, sir. Yes, he is. He must have seen something through the window. Uh, he's waving again. He wants us to go over there. He's gone into the cottage. Get in the front, Inspector. Be quick, start the car. Let's get over there. There's Bellamy, coming out of the cottage. What happened, Bellamy? Did you hear that shot? Yes. I was about 20 yards from the cottage when I heard it. I realized that it had come from the cottage, and I... You ran over to the window. Yes, we saw you. There's a man. I don't know who he is. He's been shot. He's in the kitchen. Come along, Sir Graham. A watch. A wallet. Identification card. Uh-huh. It's the laddie we've been looking for, all right. It's Abel Dunn. But what happened? He obviously came here to meet Bellamy. Surely, if he'd intended to commit suicide... Suicide? He didn't commit suicide, Sir Graham. Just a minute. This suicide idea isn't as crazy as it sounds. Supposing he guessed that you were here. The police, I mean. He got the breeze up and decided, no, no, I guess that doesn't make sense. He'd make a run for it. What exactly happened, Bellamy? Well, I guess you saw what happened. I was about 20 yards away from the cottage. I heard the revolver shot and I dashed up to the window. You saw Dunn sprawled across the table? I saw him exactly as he is now. Did you see anyone else? Not a soul. As soon as I saw what had happened, I, I waved to you and, and dashed into the cottage. You didn't see anyone else in the cottage, I mean? No. I heard a door bang at the back, and I, I ran out there, but I certainly didn't see anybody. Of course, it's fairly dark. Well, it's dark, all right, but I should have thought if there had been anybody around, I would have spotted them. Yes, I'm inclined to agree. Who's this? Can you see, Inspector? That's Mr. Kaufman. Kaufman? I thought you told Kaufman to wait for us at Yalding. I did. Hello, Kaufman. Hello, Temple. I thought I told you to wait for us at Yalding. I got rather worried, Sir Graham. I began to wonder what exactly was going on. Who's this? His name is Dunn. Abel Dunn? Yes. So? Kaufman? Yes? Have you been here before, this evening? Why, why no, of course not. Why do you ask? I wondered, that's all. Hello, darling. You're not as late as I expected. <laughs> no, we... Mm, is that coffee I can smell? Yes. It smells delicious. Come along. Let's go into the lounge. Charlie, we'll have the coffee in the lounge. Okie dokie. I do wish you wouldn't say okie dokie. <laughs> How did you know it was Abel Dunn? He had a wallet with several letters in it. Mm. Well, it was done all right. Mm. Paul. Yes, darling? Do you really think this means the end of the Belasco affair? What do you mean? Well, if Sir Graham's right and Mrs. Forrester was Dr. Belasco, then the whole business is finished. 
Do you think Mrs. Forrester was Dr. Belasco? I don't know. Everything points towards it, and yet... Well? Paul. Yes, Steve? If I say something which sounds utterly and completely absurd, you won't think me mad. No. Well, I've got a sort of intuition. <laughs> what, again? <laughs> now, don't you laugh. I was right about Edward Day and the Gregory affair. <laughs> well, who do you suspect this time? <laughs> Charlie? <laughs> You're the one that should suspect Charlie, darling. <laughs> Yeah, what do you mean? <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, seriously. I've got the strangest sort of feeling about... Kaufman. Yes. Why? What makes you say that? Mm. Kaufman's got a pretty good record, you know, Steve. To all intents and purposes, there doesn't appear to be the slightest justification for suspecting Kaufman. To all intents and purposes? Mm. I said that because... Oh, hello. Is this tonight's paper? Yes. They've got the Forrester story on the front page. Oh, so I see. It's not a very good photograph of her, is it? I didn't think it was too bad. After all, newspaper photographs are never very good. I beg your pardon, Mum, but uh, we've got a visitor. Charlie, at this hour? Who on earth could... Good heavens, Mr Nelson. What's the meaning of this, Mr Nelson? I'm sorry to crash in like this, Mrs Temple. It's quite unforgivable, I know, but... Uh, <clears throat> well, uh... That's all right, Charlie. Here we go. Now, what is it? You've seen tonight's papers? Yes. About Mrs. Forrester, I mean. About her being dead, of course. Well, that's just the point. What do you mean? She's not dead. Not dead? I saw her myself half an hour ago. Episode 7. The Suspects. Paul Temple is visited by Sir Graham Forbes of Scotland Yard and by a Mr. Philip Kaufman, who is attached to the special branch. Kaufman tells Paul Temple about a notorious criminal known as Dr. Belasco. Temple promises to try and discover the identity of Belasco, and during the course of certain investigations, makes the acquaintance of the following suspects. Mrs. Forrester, Joseph, a servant of Mrs. Forrester, Henry Worth, Ed Bellamy, the proprietor of the Machicha Club, and a certain Dr. David Nelson. Hello. What's this? It's the evening paper. They've got the Forrester story on the front page. So I see. It's not a very good photograph of her, is it? I didn't think it was too bad. After all, newspaper photographs are never very... Uh, beg your pardon, Mum. Charlie. What the devil? Why, Mr Nelson? What's the meaning of this, Mr Nelson? Well, I'm sorry bursting in like this, Mrs Temple. It's quite unforgivable, I know, but... Um, well... <clears throat> That's all right, Charlie. You can go. So. Now, what is it? You've seen tonight's papers? Yes. About Mrs. Forrester, I mean. About her being dead? Yes. Well, that's just the point. What do you mean? She's not dead. Not dead? I saw her myself, half an hour ago. I don't believe it. Where did you see her? I saw her coming out of the house in Barclay House Place. I... Go on. You don't believe me, do you? Well, I must confess I find it rather difficult to believe you. You must be mistaken, Mr Nelson. I'm not mistaken. I tell you, I saw Mrs Forrester as clearly as I can see you now. You say you saw her come out of the house in Barclay House Place? Yes. When? I have told you. About half an hour ago. Were you watching the house? Well... Well, were you? <sighs> yes, I suppose I was. Why? I'll be frank with you. I've always believed that Mrs Forrester was Dr Belasco. When I read that she'd been killed in a motor accident, I just couldn't believe it. I had a strange sort of feeling that... That what? That it wasn't true. I don't know what made me think that. I went down to the house. I'd been there before, you know that. I stood watching it. I must have been there, oh, about ten minutes or so, when suddenly the door opened and Mrs Forrester came out. There was a car waiting for her. What was she dressed in? She had a fur coat on. The collar was turned up. If the collar of the coat was turned up, how can you be so sure that it was Mrs. Forrester? Good heavens, I know her. I've seen her dozens of times. Go on. She got into the car and drove away. Did you take the number of the car? No, I'm afraid I didn't. I was so surprised at seeing her that it never entered my head. Did this person you believed to be Mrs. Forrester? It was Mrs. Forrester. Well, did she see you? Oh, I don't know. I was sitting in my car on the other side of the road. Well, she must have noticed the car, but whether she actually noticed me or not, I, I wouldn't like to say. 
What sort of a coat was she wearing, Mr. Nelson? Hmm? What sort of fur, I mean? It was a mink coat. Dark mink. It had full sleeves and... My dear Mrs. Temple, it was Mrs. Forrester, all right. Have you told anyone else about this? No. You came straight here? No, I went back to my flat and had a drink. I was rather shaken. You felt as if you needed one? <laughs> yes. Temple? Yes? I've got a hunch that you're not exactly surprised by all this. You're right. I'm not. I did see Mrs. Forrester, didn't I? Yes. I think you must have done. But, Paul, he couldn't. Steve, listen. For some months now, ever since he arrived in this country, in fact, Dr. Belasco has carefully thrown suspicion on Mrs. Forrester. Recently, a series of developments indicated beyond any shadow of doubt that Mrs. Forrester was Dr. Belasco. Accordingly, Sir Graham issued a warrant for her arrest. I knew this would happen, however, and I told Inspector Perry that under no circumstances must Mrs. Forrester be arrested. The motor car accident was faked. But, darling, you can't hope to get away with that. I don't hope to get away with it, Steve. Not indefinitely. But for 24 hours, perhaps even 48 hours. Yes. And a lot can happen in 48 hours, Steve. But why do you think Sir Graham is wrong? About Mrs. Forrester, I mean. Why do you think he's right? Surely he must be right. Everything points to her being Dr. Belasco. Not quite everything. One could, for instance, make out a pretty good case against Mr. Worth. Worth? Ah, yes, I suppose one could. Or Joseph, for that matter. Joseph? He works for Mrs. Forrester. I'd forgotten about Joseph. And then, of course, there's yourself, Nelson. <laughs> Oh, now, of course, you're just being ridiculous. <laughs> Let's all have a very large drink. Some more coffee, darling? Hmm? Oh, thank you, Steve. Paul. Yes? I couldn't get to sleep last night for thinking about this Belasco affair. I kept turning over in my mind all the possible suspects. All the possible suspects? <laughs> you must have kept yourself pretty busy. There are half a dozen of them. Half a dozen? Not that many, surely, Steve. Well, Mrs. Forrester, one. Joseph, two. Mr. Bellamy, three. Henry Worth, four. David Nelson, five. And Mr. Kaufman, six. Kaufman? You're not really serious about Kaufman. I keep telling you he's a man of great integrity. Well, so is Inspector Dale, remember? Yes, dear. I remember. Paul. I've been meaning to ask you, have you discovered why the cigarette lighter Ross Morgan carried was identically the same as Mr. Nelson's? Yes. Oh, don't you see, Steve? Belasco forms an organisation, but the members of the organisation are not necessarily known to each other, so they have, in case of an emergency, a means of identification. They each carry identically the same kind of cigarette lighter? Exactly. Then Nelson's wife must have been a member of Belasco's organisation. Because Nelson got the cigarette lighter from her? Yes. How do you know that? We've only got his word for it. Steve, you heard Nelson last night. You heard what he said about visiting Mrs. Forrester's. Well? Well, didn't his story strike you as being rather inconsistent? What do you mean? Well, in the first place, he said that when he read that Mrs. Forrester had been killed in a car accident, he didn't believe it. He even went so far as to visit her house, in fact. Suddenly, according to his story, his suspicions are confirmed and Mrs. Forrester appears. What happens? Nelson, who apparently expected to see Mrs. Forrester, is so overcome by surprise that he immediately dashes back to his flat and mixes himself a whiskey and soda. Hmm. Paul, you know that man you found at Ryford? The man who drove the lorry? Abel Dunn, yes. Well, do you think he was murdered? I'm pretty sure he was murdered. But you don't quite know how it was done. Well, we know how it was done, darling. He was shot. But we don't know who did it. Did you examine the window, Paul? Yes, I examined because... the window. And Bellamy didn't shoot him through the window, if that's what you're thinking. Mm -hmm. He hadn't even reached the cottage when we heard the revolver shot. You know, Paul, I don't really understand this business about Mrs. Forrester. Does Sir Graham know that she's not dead? He does now. I telephoned Perry last night and told him to break the news to the old boy. But what's the point of it, darling? Oh, I should have thought the point would have been perfectly obvious. If Belasco believes... <coughs> what is it, Charlie? I beg your pardon, sir, but Sir Graham Forbes is here, sir. Ask him in, Charlie. Yes, sir. I'll bet he's absolutely furious with you. I'll bet he is. <laughs> Hello, Sir Graham. Come in. We're just having breakfast. Good morning, Steve. Would you like some coffee? I should like some coffee very much. What's the matter, Sir Graham? You don't appear to be your usual light-hearted self this morning. I don't feel particularly light-hearted, Temple. 
Now, what's all this nonsense about Mrs. Forrester? I sent Perry to Greenchurch with a warrant for her arrest. He returns with the information that she's been killed in a car accident, and I am now politely informed that she hasn't been killed at all. Sir Graham. Well? You remember when we were down at Greenchurch and Steve and I visited Camberley Lodge? Yes. Well, after Joseph and I discovered Braddock in the shrubbery at the back of the house, I went back to the house and had rather an interesting conversation with Mrs. Forrester. You never told me that, Temple. No. As a matter of fact, I bullied her into telling me quite an interesting story. What did she tell you? Well, at first, she refused to tell me anything. I think she was a little embarrassed because Steve was there. Suddenly, I realised this, and I told Steve to go back to the car and tell you exactly what had transpired. Go back to the car, Steve. Tell Sir Graham what's happened and ask him to get in touch with the local people. I'll stay here until you return. Yes. All right, Paul. Are you frightened of walking down the drive on your own? Well... Where is your car, sir? It's on the main road, Joseph, not far from the cottage you mentioned. Well, if you wish to remain here, sir, until the police arrive, perhaps I could escort Mrs Temple back to the car. No, there's no necessity. I shall be perfectly all right. Very good, madam. Well, see you later, darling. Yes, Steve. Now, if you'll excuse me, Mr Temple, I'm going to my room until the police arrive. One moment, Mrs Forrester, please. Yes? There are one or two questions I'd like to ask you. I've answered all the questions I intend to answer until the police arrive. So, if you'll kindly excuse Sit me... Sit down. I beg your pardon. You heard what I said. Sit down. Mr Temple, I wish to go to my room, so if you kindly let me pass... Sit down, Mrs Forrester, before I get tough. Joseph. Mr Temple, I don't think you quite realise what you're saying, sir. This is Mrs Forrester's house. She's quite at liberty to retire to her room if she wishes to do so. Quite at liberty, Joseph, but not just at the moment. Now, sit down, Mrs Forrester, and listen to what I've got to say. Mr Temple, I must ask you... That's to... right, Joseph. Now you're being sensible. Do you wish me to remain, madam? No, you can go, Joseph. Thank you, madam. Now what is it you want to ask me? If it's about that man, the man you've just found, I can only say I have never seen him in my life before. I don't know who he is or where he's come from. His name's Braddock. He was sent down here by Sir Graham Forbes. However, let's forget Mr Braddock, shall we? And talk about a friend of yours. A friend of mine? Yes. Mr. Worth. Mr. Worth? <laughs> now, don't tell me you've never heard of Mr. Worth. Yes, of course I have, but... <laughs> well, you would hardly call him a friend of mine. He visited your house? In town, I mean. Yes, as a matter of fact, he did. Why? I beg your pardon? I said, why did he visit your house? Because... Why are you asking these questions? Mr. Worth's got nothing whatsoever to do with what happened. Mrs. Forrester. Yes. Don't let's beat about the bush. You know why I'm here, you know why I'm asking these questions. I'm investigating the Belasco affair and I've every intention of getting the information I want. I have nothing to do with Belasco, I swear. Mrs it. Forrester, I've got a shrewd suspicion that Sir Graham Forbes is under the impression that you are Dr Belasco. Therefore, what? therefore, when he learns about Braddock, it's ten to one. Mr Temple! You don't think that I'm Belasco. Why did Henry Worth visit your house, Mrs Forrester? Why did you send a man like Harry Marks an invitation to your cocktail party? Why did you lie to me the night that you visited the Machicha? What do you mean? You knew perfectly well that Joseph was at the Machicha. You went there to meet him, didn't you? Didn't you? Yes. Why? Because... Well? Because... About six years ago... Just before my husband died, he became involved in a case known as the Hamish Frinton deal. I remember that case well. It was a new flotation that a man called Elliot Brooke was trying. Elliot Brooke was my husband. After he died, I reverted to my maiden name. Elliot was tried on an embezzlement charge and acquitted. Three months later, he died. Go on. Elliot was guilty. However, certain important documents disappeared just before the trial started. Well? Those documents are still in existence. I've been trying to buy them. In order to destroy them? Yes. Did Worth claim to have possession of the documents? Worth said that he could find them for me. He put me in touch with a man called Harry Marks. Marks was, well, he was rather a peculiar type. To put it bluntly, he was something of a snob. He insisted on meeting my friends and being invited to all my cocktail parties. Uh, I was frightened to offend the little beast because I really felt that ultimately he would get the papers. Go on. When Marx was murdered, I realised that my best plan was to get in touch with an associate of his. 
A man called Bellamy. Bellamy owns the Machicha. Yes, I know Bellamy. I sent Joseph to the Machicha and he spoke to Bellamy. Bellamy was surprised he didn't like Joseph and he insisted on meeting me before committing himself. When I arrived at the Machicha, Joseph introduced me to Ed Bellamy and he advised me to contact a man called Abel Dunn. Did you contact him? Joseph telephoned him on my behalf, but... But I answered the telephone. Yes. Mrs. Forrester, about this rather incriminating document... Yes? It wouldn't concern you by any chance, as well as your husband. <laughs> that's beside the point, Mr. Temple. As you say, Mrs. Forrester, that's beside the point. Now, tell me, how... How does Joseph fit into all of this? I knew you'd ask that one sooner or later. Well? Joseph used to work for my sister. Before the war, she had a villa on the Riviera, and Joseph... Well, I... I suppose you'd call him a very old friend of the family. You trust him? Oh, explicitly. He's a very intelligent person, you know, and a born organiser. I leave all my personal affairs to Joseph, and I can assure you they are in very capable hands. I'm sure they are, Mrs Forrester. Now, may I go to my room? Or have you any further questions you wish to ask me? No, you may go, Mrs Forrester. About a quarter of an hour later, you returned with Steve and the Green Church people. Mm. But you know, Temple, I still don't understand your attitude over this business. Supposing Mrs. Forrester was telling the truth, why did you take the trouble... Sir Graham, for several weeks now, Belasco has been throwing suspicion onto Mrs. Forrester, so I decided to find out what exactly would happen once Belasco was under the impression that Mrs. Forrester was dead. It's obvious what'll happen. He'll shift the suspicion onto someone else. Well, supposing Steve is right, and he does shift the suspicion onto someone else, where does that get us? It gets us down to a question of simple arithmetic, doesn't it? Two from six leaves four... You mean we can forget Mrs. Forrester and concentrate... Exactly. Yes, but tell me, does anyone else know about Mrs. Forrester? You know, Perry knows. And Kaufman. Oh, you've told Kaufman? Yes, he was with me last night when Perry telephoned. And don't forget Mr. Nelson, darling. Nelson? And Nelson was watching the house last night and saw Mrs. Forrester leave. I feel annoyed about that because I told Perry to take particular care... It's all right, Paul, I'll take it. Hello? Hello? Who is that? Mr. Kaufman? Yes? This is Mrs. Temple. Oh, I am so sorry, Mrs. Temple. I did not recognize you. Is Sir Graham with you at the moment? Yes. Would you like a word with him? If you please. It's Mr. Kaufman, Sir Graham. Oh, thank you. Kaufman? I'm afraid I've got some bad news for you, Sir Graham. The National Fur Warehouse was broken into just after four o'clock this morning. Belasco? Well, quite obviously, Belasco was behind it, sir. How much did they get away with? Fortunately, they were disturbed. I should say about £15,000 worth. But there's rather an interesting point, Sir Graham. Well? Inspector Perry found a pencil, a small silver pencil. It was found near the side gate where they apparently forced an entrance. He swears it belongs to Mr. Bellamy. Mr. Bellamy? Yes. Hmm. Well, thank you, Calvin. I shall be at the office in about an hour. Very good, sir. Well? Apparently, Dr. Belasco has switched suspicion onto Mr. Bellamy. Good evening, Mr. Temple. I'm sorry we're a little on the late side. That's all right, Inspector. As a matter of fact, I've only just arrived myself. Good evening. Oh, good evening, Carmen. Have you seen Bellamy? Not yet. Don't worry. He knows we're here all right. If the truth was known, I expect he's watching us at this very moment. I'm just surprised. Have you got the pencil with you? Aye. Right. You are sure it is Bellamy's? Quite sure. All right. Let's see what he's got to say about it. Kaufman. Yes? Don't you think it might be rather a good idea if one of us stayed down here? I mean, supposing Bellamy gets tough and decides to make a dash for it. Yes, perhaps you're right. I'll wait in the hall near the main entrance, near the telephone box. Right. Come along, Mr. Temple. Come in. Come in, Inspector. Hello, Mr. Temple. Bellamy. Where's the other guy? Don't tell me he bailed out. I suppose you've been watching us through that perishing periscope of yours. <laughs> sure. Well, sit down. <clears throat> sit down. Now, what can I get you? Scotch and soda? Not for me. Mr. Temple. No? Okay, we'll skip it. Bellamy, you remember that silver pencil of yours? Uh, the small one? Sure, sure I remember it. Have you still got it? Why, yes. Where is it? Why, it's in this drawer. That's funny. Can't you find it? Well, it must be here somewhere. When did you see it last? Why, only the other... 
Say, what's all this about, anyway? Is this your pencil, Mr. Bellamy? Why, yes. You know darn tooting well that's my... Say, where did you get that? I found it, or rather, Sergeant Lester did. Where? He found it this morning near one of the side entrances to the National Fur Warehouse. The National Fur... That place was knocked off last night. It's in the papers. Why... What is this? A checkup? You can call it that if you like. What else is it? Okay, go on, let's have it. Where were you last night? I was here, at the club. I arrived about a quarter past eight. What time did you leave? Just after five. This morning? Yeah. Wasn't that rather late? Sure. What time do you usually leave? Oh, it varies. Usually between half past one and two. What made you so late this morning? My accountant dropped in. We had to do a certain amount of work on the books. Who is your accountant? A man called Deming. Charlie Deming. Deming, Seaman and Brooks? Yes. Do you know them? Aye, they're very reliable people. What time did Mr. Deming arrive? About 10 o'clock. And he left? He left with me, just after five. Did anyone see you leave? No, I don't think... Oh, yeah, Sergeant Carter. He was passing the door just as we were going out. Did he see you? Of course he did. As a matter of fact, we had a chat. I introduced him to Mr. Deming. Gee, I guess I've been kind of lucky. I mean, if I'd gone home last night at the usual time and gone straight to bed, I... Boy, I've certainly been lucky. You certainly have, Mr. Bellamy. I suppose there's no doubt about Mr. Bellamy's alibi? None whatsoever. He was telling the truth, all right. It's been checked and double-checked. I don't want to be late tomorrow morning, darling. I know what that means. You'll be snoring like a pig long after eight o'clock. For your information, I do not snore like a pig. I may purr occasionally. Gosh, I'm tired. Yes, well, move up, darling. I don't expect to have any bed clothes, but I would at least like to sleep on the mattress. What time is it? It's a quarter past eleven. I thought it was later than that. I didn't think so. Paul, hmm? you know, I still think I'm right about Kaufman. You're always right, darling. Yes. Well, I'm very sleepy. Good night. Good night. Oh. What's that? It's you, darling. You've been making the most extraordinary noises. Me? Yes. Surely I don't make a noise like a bell. I wouldn't put it past you. Telephone. <laughs> Hello? Hello? Mr. Temple. Yes? Who's that? Mr. Temple. Listen. Two o'clock. What? Did you hear what I said? Listen to the clock. Who is that? Who? The devil. Paul, oh, what is it? Well, it sounded to me like Worth. Well, I suppose it could have been Kaufman. What did he say? He said, listen to the clock. Is that all he said? Yes. Well... What does he mean, listen to the clock? Does he mean our clock? That clock on the mantelpiece? I suppose he must do. I don't get it. I wonder if he... What time is it? What time does the clock say? Why, it's a quarter past eleven. Quarter past eleven? But it was quarter past eleven when we came to bed. All right, darling, there's no need to get excited. It only means that the clock stopped and... But it can't have stopped. We can hear it. We can... Paul? The hands aren't moving. The clock's ticking, but it must be... Stay where you are. What are you going to do? Don't move. Paul, darling! Right, I've, I've got it, I've got it. OK. Here we go! Oh, no! Oh, no. oh, Paul! Paul! Who's that? Paul, who is it? Hello? Mr. Temple? Yes? This is Joseph. I... I... What is it, Joseph? I have got to see you, Mr. Temple. It's, it's urgent. It's desperately urgent. I, I, I... Joseph, what is it? What's the matter? I, I've got to see you. I've got to tell you about Belasco. Where are you? Where are you speaking from? I'm in a telephone box on the corner of Wesley Street. I'm all shot to pieces, Mr. Temple. They've, they've beaten me up. They've... Stay where you are, Joseph. I'll be there in five minutes. Paul, what is it? What's happened? Get dressed, darling. Be quick. Get dressed. What's happened? I heard a blinking explosion like one of the old doodle bugs. Get the car out of the garage for me, Charlie. Here's the key. Catch. Be quick. Okey-doke. There's the telephone box over on the corner. 
You stay in the car, Steve. No, Paul. Hadn't I better... Stay in the car, darling. Please. Shan't be a minute. <laughs> Who is it? Who is... It's me, Joseph. Temple. Oh, you're badly hurt. It's, it's my back. My, my back and my face. They, 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 they beat me. They beat me until I, I couldn't stand it any longer. I couldn't stand it. I, Give I, me your arm. I'll get you over to the car. Uh, no, 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 Mr. Temple. You, you shouldn't have come here. You, you shouldn't have come. What do you mean? Why, you telephoned me. Don't you see? Don't you see? They, they made me telephone you. They, they made me do it. They made me. They beat me until I... I had to do it. Oh, oh. What do you mean? Joseph. What do you mean? It's... It's a trap. Episode 8. The Final Curtain. Paul Temple is visited by Sir Graham Forbes of Scotland Yard and by a Mr. Philip Kaufman, who is attached to the special branch. Kaufman tells Paul Temple about a notorious criminal known as Dr. Belasco. During the course of investigations, Temple makes the acquaintance of the following suspects. Mrs. Forrester, Joseph, a servant of Mrs. Forrester, Henry Worth, Ed Bellamy, the proprietor of the Machicha Club, and a certain Mr. David Nelson. Late one night, Temple receives an urgent telephone call from Joseph. Accompanied by Steve, Temple makes his way to the telephone box on the corner of Westley Street and Shaftesbury Avenue. Mr. Temple, you, you shouldn't have come here. You shouldn't have come. What do you mean? Why, you telephone? Don't you see? Don't you see? They made me telephone you. They made me do it. They made me. They beat me until I, I had to do it. Oh, oh. What do you mean? Uh, Joseph, what do you mean? It's... It's a trap. A trap? Yes. Get back to the car. I get away from here. Oh, yeah. Paul? What's the matter with him? He's been beaten up, Steve. Oh, how horrible. Is he dead? No. No, I don't think so. He's fainted. Steve, listen. They made Joseph telephones. We've walked into a trap. A trap? But how on earth could we have... Look, there's a car coming. Oh, I wish I'd remembered that revolver in the dressing table. I could have... I did. Oh, good girl, Steve. Now, get behind the telephone box. Quickly. Quickly! Who is it? Oh. I think he's hit Joseph. Who's driving the car? Steve, keep behind the box. Now, where's that revolver? Quickly, darling, where is it? Here we are. Good. Now, keep behind the box. Oh, look out, Paul. Don't show yourself. In I'm place. going to hit his blasted tire if it's the last thing I do. You've hit it. Why, Timothy, I have. He's skidding. He's skidding. Great Scott, he's turning over. Oh, Paul, look. Look, the car's on fire. Steve, go to Joseph. I'll see you in a minute. Yes, all right, but do be careful. Paul, oh, there's someone climbing out of the car. Why? It's David Nelson. Nelson, don't move. Do you hear me, Nelson? Don't move. Who is it? I can't see him. There's this smoke. I... Ah, it's you, Temple. Don't move, Nelson. If you do, I warn you, I shall fire. You think you're damn clever. Keep your hand away from that pocket. Nelson, I warn you. What do you want me to do? You know where the telephone box is. Turn round and walk towards it. And if I refuse... I shall pull this trigger. Temple. Yes? Do you think I'm Dr. Belasco? Since you ask me, I think... Why are you... <coughs> give me that revolver! <coughs> you give me that revolver! <coughs> Paul, are you all right? Yes. Yes. Oh. Oh, what did you hit him with? I found this spanner. As a matter of fact, I nearly tripped over it. What about Joseph? He's dead. One of the bullets caught him on the side of the head and... Stay here with Nelson. I'm going across to the phone box. Paul? Yes, darling? Is David Nelson Dr. Belasco? No, Steve. Is it? It's half past eleven, Steve. I brought you some coffee. Half past eleven? Oh, good heavens. I should have... Uh, Paul, you're dressed. Yes, I've been up for hours. I've been down to the yard, darling, to see Sir Graham. Paul? Here's your coffee. What are you laughing at? 
You look exactly like the morning after the night before. I feel exactly like the morning after the night before. <laughs> Drink up your coffee, Steve. Oh. Oh. Paul, mm -hmm. if David Nelson isn't Dr. Velasco, then how exactly does he fit into all this? Well, as you know, when Dr. Velasco arrived in this country, he formed an organisation. Nelson was a member until he fell out with Velasco and... and started an organisation of his own. Exactly. He knew that his wife, Reenie, was friendly with Mrs. Forrester and he tried to persuade Reenie to get certain information about Mrs. Forrester so that he could blackmail her. He was very anxious to lay his hands on the Hamish Frinton document. This was the document that Mrs. Forrester's husband, Elliot Brooke... Yes, I remember, darling, but why did Reenie Nelson commit suicide? Because she found out that her husband was mixed up with Velasco. Then his story about her borrowing money from Mrs. Forrester was simply... An, an attempt on Nelson's part to convince you that he was the kind, devoted husband endeavouring to solve the mystery of his wife's suicide. Yes. He added strength to the story by telling me that he had engaged a private inquiry agent. But he did engage her. We saw her at the cafe. Ah. Mary Hamilton was a member of the Nelson set-up. She was planted at Worth's cafe by Nelson in order to watch Worth. Suddenly, Nelson became suspicious and found that she was playing in with Worth. So he murdered her the night we arrived at the cafe? Yes. But how do you account for the fact that you found Nelson's cigarette lighter at Abel Dunn's flat? Well, Belasco placed the lighter on the stairs in order to throw suspicion onto Nelson. But... But what? Well, from what you say, I gather I was wrong about Kaufman and Henry Worth is Dr. Belasco. But why should he warn us about that bomb last night in the clock? As you say, if he's Dr. Belasco, why should he do that? Yes. Paul, what about Joseph? Uh, Nelson tried to force Joseph to go in with him, as Joseph knew a great deal about Mrs. Forrester and her friends and would have been a valuable asset to Nelson. But Joseph refused and was beaten up. Then suddenly Nelson hit upon the idea of getting Joseph to telephone me and... Yes, come in. I beg your pardon, Mum. What is it, Charlie? Uh, Inspector Perry's here, sir, with Mr. Kaufman. They'd like a word with you. Inspector Perry? Yes, sir. Yes, all right, Charlie. Tell them I shan't be a moment. OK. Now, I wonder what Inspector Perry wants. It's rather odd that he... Did you see Perry? At the yard, I mean. No, I only saw Sir Graham. I'll be back in a minute, darling. I quite agree with what you say, my dear Inspector, but if, on the other hand, Worth deliberately telephoned Temple with the intention... Good morning, gentlemen. Ah, so here you are, monsieur. Good morning, Mr. Temple. Good morning, Inspector. What can I do for you? Sir Graham asked me to tell you that the meeting's been called for three o'clock, sir. It's in Superintendent Bradley's office. Three o'clock, yes. All right, Inspector, I'll be there. We're, uh, <clears throat> picking up Mr. Worth this morning, sir. A what? You, you mean a warrant? Yes, sir. Whose idea is that? Mr. Kaufman's? Have you any objection? You think that Worth... I think that we are drawing very near to the final curtain, Mr. Temple. Worth is implicated in this business, so we cannot afford to take any risks. Does that mean that you think... That I think Worth is Dr. Belasco? Yes. It means precisely what I say. We cannot afford to take any risks. Well, can I get you a drink? No. No, thank you. We must be going. Three o'clock, Mr. Temple. Yes, three o'clock, Inspector. Thank you. And how is Mrs. Temple's this morning? I trust that your unfortunate experience last night has not unduly... Hello, have you gone to sleep again, Steve? Oh, good gracious. I, darling, I don't think I shall ever get up today. <laughs> what did Mr. Kaufman want? Oh, nothing very much. There's a meeting called for three o'clock. Who are you telephoning? Worth. Worth? But why are you telephoning Worth? You'll hear. Hello? Hello? Mr. Worth? Who is that? This is Temple here. Oh, hello, Mr. Temple. How are you this morning? Alive and kicking, thanks to you, my friend. Uh, you found it all right? Yes, I found it all right. Otherwise, I shouldn't be talking to you. I didn't know what to do, Mr. Temple. I was desperately worried, and I just didn't know what to do. How did you know about it? I overheard Belasco giving instructions to one of his men. It was quite by accident. B but I realized what was going on and decided to telephone you. Yeah. Well, one good term deserves another, Mr. Worth. What do you mean? You've got about 15 minutes. They've got a warrant out for you. Perry's on his way to the cafe. A warrant for me? Yes. Is this the truth, Mr. Temple? Yes. Uh, Worth, tell me, that night you turned up at Abel Dunn's. Well? Did Belasco send you there? But of course. I, I told you the truth that night, Mr. Temple. I, I swear I did. I but you must realize I told you the truth. You must realize it because... Because what? Because you know the identity of Dr. Belasco, don't you? Yes. 
Mr. Temple, uh, you're not joking about the warrant? No, I'm not joking. Well, uh, thanks for the tip. Goodbye, Worth, and good luck. Uh, I'll feed us in. Paul? Yes? Then Henry Worth isn't Dr. Belasco. No, darling. Henry Worth isn't Dr. Belasco. <laughs> Graham. Thank you. Skull. Skull. What's on your mind? I'm rather worried, Temple. I feel somehow that... That what? Well, to be frank, I'm not so sure that Steve should be in on this. You know, Belasco, you know exactly... I agree, Sir Graham, but you try and keep Steve out of it. I'm darned if I can. Once a newspaper woman, always a newspaper woman. <laughs> By the way, did Perry pick up Worth this morning? No, he didn't. I've got a shrewd suspicion that someone tipped him off. Tipped him off, really? It's extraordinary. Most extraordinary. Will you have another drink? Oh, no, thank you. This man, Sir Graham, the man that's tailing Belasco, he's completely reliable, I take it? Completely reliable. Temple, you're sure, quite sure, aren't you, that... Quite sure, Sir Graham. It seems extraordinary. I'd have bet my bottom dollar that it was... Excuse me. Hello? Mr. Temple? Yes? This is the Machija Club. Hold the line, please. Mr. Bellamy wants you. Hello there. Mr. Temple? Yes. Ed Bellamy here. Hello, Bellamy. How are you? I'm fine. Well, what's going on around here? What do you mean? This place of mine is swarming with dicks. It's lousy with them. <laughs> no, but give us a break. I'm supposed to be running a nightclub, not a policeman's picnic. That's all right, Bellamy. Don't worry. It's positively for one performance only. Yeah, but seriously, it's getting in my hair. There's only one well-dressed guy out of the whole bunch. Don't tell me that's Mr. Kaufman. Look, what's it all in aid of, anyway? You probably don't know it, Bellamy, but you've got a distinguished guest at the Machicha. Well, not too distinguished, I hope, or we shall be landed with the bill. Who is it, anyway? Dr. Belasco. Dr. Are you kidding? I'm not kidding anyone, Bellamy. Dr. Belasco? Is this on the level? On the level. Temple, are you coming here tonight? Yes, I shall be there with you in about half an hour. Incidentally, I shall probably want to use your office and borrow that periscope gadget of yours. Yeah, that's okay. I'll be on the lookout for you. You know where the office is. I do. Goodbye. Goodbye. That was Bellamy. He doesn't appear to be impressed by your colleagues, Sir Graham. He will be, when things get tough. <laughs> Hello, Sir Graham. How are you? I'm fine, thank you, Steve. Well, you don't look it, and you don't sound it either. You look very depressed. Darling, do you like the dress? Yes, rather. But haven't I seen it before somewhere? Of course. It's the one you saw in South Audley Street, the one you said was too expensive. Oh, yes, I thought... Oh, yes. <laughs> Steve... Yes, Sir Graham. I do hope you won't think I'm being difficult if I... If you suggest that I stay at home this evening? Yes. Paul, have you been getting on to Sir Graham because... I never said a word, darling. Honestly, I didn't. In any case, I know what it is once you've made up your mind. Here's a cocktail. Thank you. I don't want to be difficult about this, Steve, but I do feel that... Then don't be difficult, Sir Graham. Good gracious, who on earth arranged those flowers? Charming. Steve, I do wish you would listen to Sir Graham. You know perfectly well why we're going to the Machicha Club, Steve. We're picking up Belasco, and he may get awkward. Sir Graham, I was in on the Belasco affair at the beginning, and I have every intention of being in on it at the end. Nothing in the whole wide world would stop me from going to the Machicha Club tonight. So be a darling, and don't waste your breath. Now, mix me another drink, Paul, and then we'll be off. Good heavens, have you knocked that back already? Sir Graham? Not for me, Temple. Here we are, Steve. Thank you. Uh, Steve, look here. Supposing we compromised, and instead of you actually coming to the Machicha with us, you... Uh, Is anything the matter? Oh, I don't know. I... Oh, Paul, I feel rather odd. I... Oh. What is it, Steve? What's the matter with you, darling? I, I don't know. I feel dizzy. I feel... Poor I... Oh. She's fainted. Yeah, it's all right, I've got it. Uh, lay her down on the tea. Yes. Temple, what is it? Uh, it's all right, Sir Graham. I gave her a sleeping draught. She's spark out. She'll be out for hours. <laughs> Temple, you are the limit. Nothing, nothing in the whole wide world would stop me from going to the Machicha Club tonight. <laughs> Good old Steve. <laughs> Come along, Sir Graham. Uh, don't worry about Steve. She'll be all right. I'll put both your coats together, sir. Thank you. I'll take the ticket. Ah, very good, sir. Oh, thank you, sir. Good evening, sir. Good evening, Perry. Good evening, Mr. Temple. Good evening, Inspector. Everything all right, Perry? Yes, sir. Nothing to report, sir. You're still here, sir. Good. 
Come along, Temple. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening. I believe you have a table reserved for me, Mr. Temple. But of course. This way, please, sir. Thank you. There's Coven. Yes. Here we are, sir. Your waiter will be along in a moment. Thank you. I'm going upstairs to see Bellamy. Shall be long. Yes, all right. Who is it? Can I come in? Who it? Oh, hello, Temple. Yeah, sure, sure, come in. What's the matter, Mr. Bellamy? You sound nervous. Nervous? Are you kidding? I'm like a jelly in a high wind. Ever since you made that crack about Belasco being here at the Machicha. But he is here, I've seen him. Yeah, I know, I know, that's why I'm nervous. You know, Bellamy, I've got a feeling that you're not quite so tough as you're painted. Well, compared with guys like Velasco, I'm a violet, and I don't care who knows it. <laughs> Can I get you a drink? Are you having one? What do you think? Do you mind if I have a look at that periscope gadget of yours? Go ahead. You know, this is an awfully good idea of yours, Bellamy. You can see the whole of the restaurant. Yeah, and on a clear day, you can see practically the whole of Scotland Yard. Here's your drink. Thanks. You see that man standing over there? Yes. Flatfoot. <laughs> you see that guy drinking ginger ale? It's Flatfoot. Hmm. Turned around. Uh, do you notice the big guy? The one in tails. Yeah, the one in tails. So help me. I take it you recognize Divisional Inspector Ronson? Recognize him? Who wouldn't recognize him? He doesn't even deceive the cigarette girl. Okay, turn it around. Isn't that Sir Graham Forbes? Yes. Say, where's Perry? Oh, oh, there he is. I thought he'd be somewhere around. And there's your French friend. Do you see him? Uh, Kaufman, yes, I see him. You know, if you ask me, I think that guy's a bit of a mystery. You know, I can hardly believe he's a detective. He doesn't talk like one. He doesn't act like one. He doesn't even dress like one. Perhaps he's a very good detective, Mr. Bellamy. <laughs> yeah, could be. You know, maybe you've got something there. <laughs> Temple? Yes? Where's Dr. Belasco? Dr. Belasco? Yes. Point him out to me on the periscope. Well, I'm afraid I can't very well do that. Why not? Well, you see, he just doesn't happen to be in the restaurant. Well, where is he? You said he was here. You said he was here at the Machincha. Oh, he's here, all right. As a matter of fact, he's standing right beside me. Right beside you? Are you crazy? Why, I'm the only person that's standing right beside you. You don't think that I'm Dr. Belasco? Aren't you, Mr. Bellamy? You nuts! What? What makes you think I'm Belasco? Two nights ago, I made a phone call from here to Sir Graham Forbes. I told him to follow a taxi that intended to take Steve and me to a shop owned by one of your men, a man by the name of Abel Dunn. You overheard that phone call, Bellamy, and shot the driver of the taxi so that he shouldn't lead Sir Graham to the address in Layman Street. Go on. When David Nelson got ambitious and decided to leave the Belasco set up, you fixed his car. That's a lie. You fixed his car and then conveniently turned up at the scene of the accident in order to divert suspicion. That's a dirty lie. At the beginning, you intended to throw suspicion onto Mrs. Forrester. That's why you told me that Joseph had asked you about Dr. Belasco. You suggested to Mrs. Forrester that she should get in touch with Abel Dunn regarding the Hamish Frinton papers. Later, however, you switched suspicion onto Worth and told Sir Graham Forbes a completely false story about Worth visiting the Machicha. Worth did visit the Machicha. You know darn well he did. He told me to take 900 pounds down to Ryford. What are you talking about? Didn't we go there? Didn't we find... The dead body of Abel Dunn? And you know why, Bellamy? Because the poor devil had already served his purpose. Are because... you suggesting that I shot Dunn? Of course you did. And shall I tell you how? You walked across to the cottage. When you were about 20 yards away, you took a revolver from your pocket and fired a shot into the ground. That was the shot Sir Graham and I heard that was supposed to have killed Abel Dunn. You put the revolver back into your pocket, dashed up to the cottage, peered through the window, waved to Sir Graham and me, and then walked into the cottage, fitted a silencer to your revolver, and shot the poor devil dead. Why, you cunning swine, I'll... Put that lamp down! Put that... <coughs> no! Oh, I'm a fool, a complete idiot. Oh, my head. Oh, what happened what? Open the door! Open the door! Sir Graham! Perry! For heaven's sake, open the door! Ladies and gentlemen, please, please. There's no cause for alarm. The club is not being raided. 
Now, kindly return to your tables. Start the orchestra and keep playing. Have you seen Ronson, sir? Yes, he's checked on the goods entrance, but it's no use, I'm afraid. It's beginning to look pretty black, sir. Yes, Sir Graham. Carter's been on the Bruton Street entrance all the time. He's not seen him. Oh, it's nearly 15 minutes ago, Sir Graham. If he's not in the building, then by God, he's miles away by now. He must be in the building, Temple. Unless there's a concealed entrance onto the roof, sir, and he's made a dash for it across... Yes, Kaufman. You're wanted on the telephone, Temple. It's your wife. Steve? She sounded most perturbed. She told me to tell you it was urgent. But I don't understand how the devil she... Which box is it? It's the one in the hall, near the cloakroom. Thanks. Is that you, Steve? Paul, listen, this has got to be quick. I'm in a desperate hurry, darling. Now listen, I left the flat about half an hour after you and Sir Graham. But you couldn't have done I gave you a sleeping draught. You don't think I fell for that corny old gag? I emptied it into the flower vase. Well, I... Paul, do listen. I took a taxi down to the Machicha Club. Just as I arrived, I saw Bellamy climbing down one of the fire escapes. He had a car waiting for him. Did you follow him? That's what I'm trying to tell you. Steve, I... did you follow him? Yes, he's on the 10.15 to Benworth. It leaves Euston in exactly four minutes. On the 10.15 to... Oh, my Lord, that's... Steve, where are you? Where are you speaking from? I'm at Euston. I'm just getting on the train. Oh, for heaven's sake, don't do that. He's extremely dangerous. Darling, listen. The train stops at Bletchdale. That's about 35 miles down the line. If you get in the car, there's just a chance... OK, you... OK, Steve, I'll make it. Don't worry, darling. I'll make it. I've been so How worried. Does David get his safe? Where is he? He's in the next compartment, darling. Are you sure? Yes. Is he alone? Yes. He hasn't seen you? No, I was terribly careful. Good girl, Steve. What are you going to do? Take this revolver, follow close behind me, and keep me covered. Yes, all right. Temple, what are you doing here? Don't move, Bellamy. Don't move. Paul, what's he doing? Bellamy, I warn you, if you move, I'll shoot. Paul! He's trying to get out the other side. Bellamy, don't be a damn fool. Stay where you are. Okay, go ahead and shoot. Go on. I warn you, move away from that door. <clears throat> okay, shoot. Paul, he's going to jump. Bellamy, I'm warning you for the last time. Move away from that door. You haven't got the nerve to shoot, Temple. You know darn well you have... Oh! Oh! Paul, he's slipping. Bellamy! Paul, catch him. Get hold of his coat, darling. Oh! <sighs> Listen, there's another train coming. There's another train coming! Ah! Have another cake, Sir Graham. No, thank you, Temple. I really ought to be making a move. Nonsense. Another cup of tea, darling. You know, there's something I don't quite understand. Paul. Yes, there's something I don't understand either. Why do you always have to eat with your mouth full? Well, <laughs> you can't eat with your mouth empty. Oh, I mean, talk with... <laughs> <laughs> we know what you mean, darling. <laughs> we checked up on Lord Craymore Temple. Mm? He apparently worked for Belasco, and like Harry Marks, suddenly decided to double-cross him. Oh, incidentally, the Greenchurch people have picked up a man called Alan. He's the fellow that Worth told us about. It looks as if he's the man that beat up Braddock and, acting on Belasco's instructions... Dumped him at Mrs Forrester's. Yes. The thing I don't understand is why Bellamy went down to Ryford. Surely if he'd wanted to get rid of Abel Dunn... Oh, don't overlook the fact that Belasco, or Bellamy if you like, Steve, was very sure of himself. He looked upon the trip to Ryford simply as a means of pulling the wool over our eyes. Exactly. Also, I think he felt that even if we did tend to suspect him, that trick outside the cottage would convince us that he couldn't possibly have shot Dunn and consequently couldn't possibly be Belasco. Yes. You know, Sir Graham, Belasco was a pretty shrewd bird. And I arranged for Mrs. Forrester to disappear and pretend to be dead. In order to convince me that she wasn't Dr. Belasco? Yes. I felt confident that he'd switch suspicion onto someone else. As a matter of fact, I rather favoured Kaufman. But you saw what happened. He saw through my little ruse and actually switched suspicion onto himself. You mean the silver pencil? Yes. Quite frankly, that rather shook me. I began to wonder if I was on the wrong track. As soon as I realised that Bellamy had provided himself with a first-class alibi, and too good an alibi, I saw what he was getting at. He was, in fact, trying to convince you that Belasco had switched suspicion onto Bellamy. That's why one of his men planted the pencil at the warehouse. Exactly. Oh, he was a shrewd bird, all right. Make no mistake about that. Well, I expect you're glad it's all over, Steve. I know I am. You are? Rather. From now on, Sir Graham, I'm going to sit back with my feet on the mantelpiece and, as Sam Dodsworth would say, think of nothing more important than the temperature of the beer. <laughs> but that's exactly what you said after the Gregory affair. Word for word. Is it? Of course it is. Well, I'm damned. 
<laughs> oh, darling. Yes, well, you can laugh. You can laugh yourself silly. But this time I'm serious, really serious. I'm absolutely, positively, definitely, once and for all, finished with this sort of thing. Until the next time. Until the next time. <laughs> <laughs>